The Theosophical Society presents Joy Mills in a talk entitled, The Field of Meditation. I suggest that this evening we need to survey what I have called the whole field of meditation. See if we can discover something of its topography, something of its uh, main features. What does it look like? Um, if one is going to embark upon a journey, uh, one likes to know where one is going, uh, what one ought to take with one, uh, what it's going to be like, perhaps, when you reach your destination, and uh, various other factors about the journey itself. And meditation, I think, is a journey. It is a journey inward, principally. It is a journey of discovery. And of course, as I said earlier, ultimately, each one of us has to make the journey for himself. He has to find his own mode of travel. He has to determine the conveyance he will use. And he has to decide what he will take with him. But I would like to suggest that in that regard, it is well to travel lightly. For he who tra would travel farthest travels lightly. And in this particular journey, traveling lightly means really learning about the impedimenta that one carries about oneself. That is to say, the uh, physical nature and it's, uh, the kinds of obstructions that it can put up, the impedimenta of our emotional um, swingings, rhythms of, of movement from uh, great ecstasy to severe depression, the impedimenta that clutter the room of the mind because we are dealing with the matter of consciousness when we're talking about meditation, quite obviously. And if our mental quarters are already crammed full of a variety of ideas, notions, prejudices, obviously it is going to be a little bit difficult to clear enough space for the mind to be still. So we will be talking about all of this. But Perhaps the big question that immediately confronts us when we are considering the field of meditation is, what makes us start? Today there is a tremendous interest in this subject of meditation. It seems to be the in thing. It has been in for some few years. Interestingly enough, the Theosophical Society, which has been in existence for nearly 99 years, which means for nearly a century, has always suggested that the techniques of meditation are useful in the realization of one's own essential nature. So it has always been an in thing, if I may put it that way, with those who have been interested in the Theosophical philosophy or who have approached the Theosophical Society to discover what the organization has to offer in the way of a philosophy. But in recent years, there seems to have been a particular interest in meditation and in yoga, which is very closely aligned, uh, very closely um, uh, aligned with meditation. And we may be able to discuss some of the technical differences. Now, what makes us start, however? What arouses our interest in meditation? Why, for example, have you come to attend a series on meditation? Is it not because we become aware at some time or other in our existence, in our lives, of the fact that there must be another realm of reality than the world in which we are normally moving? We feel there must be something more 
to life than simply the round of daily existence and pushing and pulling and moving about and so on. Plato suggested that it is we start meditation because we recall, we recollect, remember a realm from which we originally <coughs> sprang. We remember a world of reality in which we were originally rooted, from which we have moved out into the diversity of incarnation. Now perhaps this is as good an explanation as any, and perhaps it will suffice at least to initiate our discussion to suggest that something is triggered within us that recalls us to another state or condition of existence, a world of reality for which we feel we are basically, inherently, essentially linked. And that if we could, in some way, move to recover that original state, we would be whole people, we would be happy people, we would be able to meet every circumstance of our existence with an equanimity, with a certain serenity, with a certain understanding that would enable us to meet whatever the situation might be. I rather like Plato's proposal that there is in each one of us the recollection of another, an inner world, a world in which we are whole, in which we find ourselves truly ourselves, where we can be ourselves without all of the paraphernalia that we seem to have to present to the world, the facade that we so often present. At times it is easier, I think, to define meditation by what it is not than by what it is. And so I would like to inject here some of the things which it is not. But again, one is entering upon the subtleties of words in many respects. And while we may discuss some of these, please hold it lightly at this moment, because obviously what we're going to be sharing and the kinds of meditations we're going to be experiencing collectively during the coming six weeks, we can't say it all at once. And so perhaps as we move along, some of the distinctions some of the differences will become clarified. But first of all, all of the writers on meditation, all of those who have written out of their own personal experience of meditating, and really meditation is ultimately defined only in the act of meditating. When one does it, as it were, one is meditating, and therefore one knows what is meditation. But all of the writers, both those who speak of the various forms of Western styles of meditation, Christian meditation, and the various philosophic schools of meditation in the West, as well as those who write of and write out of their own experience, of the Eastern schools of meditation, Hindu meditation, Buddhist meditation, Chinese meditation, all of these, everyone agrees that meditation as an act is not passive. It is not sort of sitting down with one's mouth open to see whatever will be attracted to come along. It is not just sort of entering into a negative state of being, a negative retreat, that it is positive, 
that it is an action in which one moves in a certain determined direction. In fact, one writer uses the phrase, the first deliberate action, and goes on with regard to what it involves and says, the word deliberate is worth noting here because from now on each process that we carry out must be an intended and directed act of the will. True meditation is not a negative sitting back in reverie, but, all, but it is a positive, carefully directed, and quite scientific method of working with the consciousness according to spiritual laws. This is in a very beautiful book on meditation, which we have here in the library, and I understand there are a few copies in the publishing house, in the Quest bookstore, The Silent Path, An Introduction to Meditation by Michael Eastcott. A very beautiful and a very useful book also on this subject, The Silent Path. And so he refers to it as the inner silent path. So it is not passive, it is not daydreaming, and it is not fantasizing. It is not what has been called creative brooding, although that in and of itself can be extremely useful. And anyone who has done any reflection upon a problem, who has done any reflection uh, upon a, a particular topic that in which he's pursuing uh, his studies. Uh, I know for myself, when I am preparing for a talk or writing an article, uh, I engage in a great deal of what I call, at least, creative brooding. Uh, other people may say it looks more as though I'm daydreaming, but there's a creative brooding which takes place. And this bears a certain resemblance at times, but it is not the deliberate act in, of meditation. And above all, I would like to propose that meditation is not self-hypnosis. In fact, it bears no resemblance to the hypnotic state because every faculty is brought to bear and focused as a light upon a particular subject or inwards towards a reality. And so it is essentially a creative act. It is the positive achievement of a leap in consciousness in which all areas of consciousness are harmonized, alert, and focused. It is the art of being it is the science of the self, the immortal self, not the little self, which often intrudes with its own will and its own interests and to divert our attention. Ultimately, and I'll stress this again, the path of meditation is individual, though collective meditation has its place and value, and we will experiment with some collective meditations during these sessions together. There are certain aspects of the science that may, must be grasped by every student attempting to undertake meditation. Now, basically, in the field of meditation is built, the whole science is built on the concept of graded levels of life or consciousness. And we need, therefore, to understand something of these levels. For the function of meditation, really, is to lead the conscious mind from stage to stage on an inner stairway. It is a means of progressing in consciousness. So the stairway of the self may be said to be made up of different densities of energy or consciousness. And we may speak very easily about three broad steps on this stairway of the self, three broad steps which we are accustomed to running up and down, living on, inhabiting, taking uh, uh, all, all of the events of our incarnation taking place on these three broad stairways. And this diagram may be helpful to us in understanding 
I hope you can all see it. Can you all see it? These are the three broad stairways which really together make up the personality of each one of us. And we are very much accustomed to these. Consciousness is rooted for most of us here in this personality where we have, first of all, a physical body to deal with. And we know sometimes it's difficult to deal with it. If you have ever started meditation, and I presume most of you have, if you have ever sat down and said, now I'm going to embark upon a disciplined program of daily meditation, and so you seat yourself, and I warrant you the very first day and the very first minute that you have seated yourself and you're very nice, uh, straight back and breathing nicely and so on, uh, if you use the Egyptian posture, which is the easiest for the West, which is seated in a chair, straight, and you're breathing nicely and you close your eyes, and pretty soon it's as though a fly is crawling up your leg. Or perhaps something seems to have lit on your head and you feel it. Or you're aware of a muscle twitching somewhere. Or you're suddenly, something about the physical body isn't quite right. Perhaps you're, I, I wish I'd had a drink of water before I sat down. I'm thirsty. Or suddenly you're aware of the peculiar rattle of noises and cacophony of sound that can arise from the interior organs somewhere deep within, you know. <laughs> And you listen to all of those, and the physical body is performing its own unique symphony. All of these things take place, and you think you have the physical body completely under control. You tell it where to walk, you tell it where to sit, you move it about, you get it up in the morning, sometimes with a certain reluctance, you put it to bed at night, sometimes also with a certain reluctance, but just try to bring it into complete alignment with the interior will that says, I am going to use the body as my instrument. I intend that the body shall really perform as I say it shall perform, because I can control it. I can master its various and sundry activities. Well, this is a difficulty that we encounter right at the outset. Within the physical realm, within the physical body, within the whole physical structure, we are talking about also much more than just the dense physical body which we may see or feel or be aware of. For the physical realm also moves all the way from what we might call the dense to the etheric. And the concept of an etheric aspect, an etheric counterpart of the physical body is becoming a ex very well-known aspect of the entire study of the fields of energy and consciousness which surround man. This is no longer just a, a, an idea found in theosophical literature. Many scientists are postulating the existence of an etheric. And it's a very interesting study, and one can go into that. So the physical level that we're talking about moves from the densest material, solid structure to the etheric. Then the next broad stairway with which we are concerned has been called the astral in many books. It's the emotional level. And here we come to, in meditation, in the discipline of meditation, a real struggle, a battleground very often, a very real battleground. And this again is a level which has different densities. 
from what we might call the brutal emotions, the densest emotions, brutalizing in nature, to emotions of aspiration and inspiration, emotions of beauty and gentleness and purity and love this whole gamut of the emotional nature. And again, how frequently when we initiate our uh, disciplines of meditation, embark upon this journey inward to the immortal self, to this realm of reality, we come up against all of the emotions that would push us now this way, now that, that would plunge us into depression or lift us to heights of ecstasy, which are beautiful perhaps, but again in which we are not in control. We have not used it. We have not focused the emotions. Again, we are dealing with an area of our nature, a very important area, not to be suppressed, not to be set aside, but to be keyed attuned as an instrument to be used, to be used properly in the service of the whole. Well, we really cannot separate this particular stair from the one above it, because the two are very much related. And although we can look at them in a diagram quite separately, and we can say things about them that would seem to provide a distinction between these two levels, essentially they are meshed together. For the third stairway, which is well known to us, of course, is the mental level. And again, with corresponding densities, from concrete thought to the highest abstract thought. Now, our first, prog uh, our pers first uh, need in embarking upon the science of meditation is learning to use these three vehicles, these three levels, operate fully on these three stairs of our being, operate in a way in which we can say that these energies within us are directed as we would direct them, because we are not this personality. We may use it. We may adapt it. We may refine it and build it and focus it. But we are not the personality. These are steps and very useful steps on the path inward to the immortal self. And so there are steps beyond these, less easily definable in concrete language, but which, to which we may either broadly assign the term spiritual or may more specifically name as the intuitional or buddhic, as you will see it in many of the books, and the spiritual or atmic, that realm of the pure self in terms of the immortal will. And so here is this vast realm into which we can move, which has been called the individuality of man, and beyond that, into that which is the essential self, the monad, the enduring pilgrim, that which truly is the universal man, as it were. This is a very useful diagram to contemplate, because this is the field of meditation. This is the path that we are determining to take. Now, before I open this to discussion, I'd like to move along with just a few more points in the survey of this field. I would like to suggest that at the very outset, if one is really determined, I'd like to at least experiment with the science of meditation. At least I would like to feel that I have taken it up. Then I think one must be very honest with oneself and examine very, very closely what is the purpose? What is my purpose 
as it were. What is the goal in undertaking meditation? And I s suggest that there is a need for great honesty, for no one outside will ask you, but if you fool yourself, you will be the only one to know. But if you fool yourself and say it's some lofty aim, when really it is not, when it's masking perhaps some other purpose, that if I can achieve the goal of meditation, then I will have power over other people. I will be able to manipulate them by thinking about them. I will be able to attain myself great wealth or riches or some spiritual status. Or I will proclaim myself in some manner as a, a teacher, a guru. And this is, of course, very popular today, you know particularly if you have on a turban and, and uh, an Eastern robe and so on, uh, you can claim, you can change your name and become Swami, whatever it may be, uh, or a yogini, somebody or other, and so on, and uh, immediately gather around yourself uh, those who, who are somehow duped by the fact that you must be a very spiritual person because you have a different name or have dressed in an unaccustomed manner. But if your aim in taking up meditation is to achieve something in order to exhibit powers, if it is to achieve, in fact, the awakening of psychic powers, and often these may come along with the discipline of meditation. They are not unusual. It is not unusual. But if your aim is along those lines, then be honest about it at least. That's all I'm asking. Just at least uh, say, all right, this is what I'm going to set out to do. But be ready to pay the price of the aim that you have set for yourself. For I suggest that if the goal is, for example, a self-centered withdrawal from life, a retreat from existence, then the science of meditation will lead you only into the morass of confusion, a swampland of self-deception. And if the goal is to gain power, then be prepared to reap the whirlwind of your objective. For that is what will come. These are not warnings, they are simply statements of fact, verified through the ages by those who have experimented in one direction or another. Well, therefore, I suggest simply look at yourself. Do you want to undertake such a journey? Is it, does it seem enticing? Would you like to know who you really are? Would you like to prepare your vehicles in such a way that they can indeed be instruments of the immortal self in order that you can become a center of peace in the world, a center of calm, in the midst of the storm that may be raging about us? Would it be useful in your own life to be able to live in such a manner that by your very presence you bring peace into the atmosphere in which you are living and working and thereby serve others? Be a help in the world instead of a hindrance, a weight upon the world. If this is the goal, if this seems a worthwhile endeavor, and of course it is not an endeavor that is achieved in a week, or even a month, or even a year. For there are those who have been meditating daily for many, many, many years and who would never think of not 
setting aside some period of the day, preferably in the morning hours, for a period of inner renewal, of inner relinking of the personality with the immortal self, with the great self of the universe, which is one with the self in all, without any outer show, and yet know from their own experience the inestimable value of this daily routine that is creative, that is unroutinized because it is creative every day anew in this inner manner. Well then, if you are interested in this deliberate act, then the first step of this deliberate act is to learn the art of relaxation. The art of how to relax the physical body, the emotions, the mind. And this is not easy. One of the, I suppose, almost apocryphal stories that arises in the Theosophical Society has to do with one of the perhaps uh, greatest leaders of the Theosophical movement, Dr. Annie Besant, who wrote a great number of books and some works on meditation and concentration and the spiritual life and the way of discovering this inner realm of the self. And it is said that when she first met the principal founder of the society, H.P. Blavatsky, she asked to be taught how to meditate. And H.P.B. threw a matchbox on the table and said, meditate on that. Because the art of meditation depends less upon the subject than upon the schooling, the deliberate act in bringing oneself into that alignment with the immortal self. And after some little time, HPB said to Dr. Besant, my dear, you don't meditate with your blood vessels. And so relaxation has a place. Relaxation is the first step to learn to breathe naturally, easily, to relax, perhaps to relax even in the midst then of all kinds of commotion. Because what ultimately develops, and I can say this from my own experience, although I don't always remember it, that one comes ultimately to a point where one can, in the midst of great confusion and great tension, sort of step back inside oneself and breathe deeply and relax a bit. And something happens. There is an inner refreshment that can come. So the first deliberate act is relaxation. And then there are ver four very important practical aspects. First of all, place. Select a place for your meditation. If you are going to embark upon a course of meditation, the deliberate act of meditation, Select a place that is the place every day. It may be some corner of your room. It may be some little area in the home that you have been able to make your own, set your own atmosphere there. It is well always, it is said, and I would agree out of my own experience, but it has been said in all the books it is well to have a place that is a regular place and equally a time. So that if, for example, meditation is for you a, a 15 or 20 or 30 minute program each day, that it takes place at the same time each day or approximately so. That is perhaps 7.30 in the morning, but then the next day you forget and 
along about noon you decide to do it, and the next day, well, maybe by 10 o'clock at night, you found a 20-minute period set aside. The irregularity, it is said, does not aid in the whole development of the science of meditation. So time, the proper place, a proper time. Then posture. This is an interesting point because today there is a, so much interest, particularly in the West, in the, so, uh, the postures of the East, particularly the lotus posture, which of course is that used in most of the Eastern countries, not all but many of the Eastern countries. The lotus posture, which is sitting cross-legged on either a floor or, or a cushion, and uh, in the customary lotus posture pose. For the West, it has been said, and even in some countries in the East, uh, even in China, it has been used, what has been called the Egyptian posture, which is sitting in a straight chair, not in a in a lounging chair where one is perhaps likely to fall asleep, but in a straight chair with the spine erect, the both feet touching the ground, the hands palm downward uh, on the thigh, and the famous Egyptian posture. This, of course, if you look at any of the books on Egypt, you'll see what is the Egyptian posture, and that is why it is called that. But choose the posture that is best for you. But in either case, the spine should be erect and there should be an ease in the physical body so that the physical body can be, as it were, just left there while you continue your journey inwards. The physical body not neglected, but just left there, quiet, able to take care of itself, uh, able to continue upright, not falling over and falling asleep, but uh, just being there so that it is alert, so that the physical brain is not um, drugged in any way or hypnotized in some way, but simply there, and you continue your journey. The third uh, the fourth, rather, the place, time, posture, the fourth aspect is rhythm. And by this is meant both the regularity of meditation and that kind of rhythm that arises within the body itself. Learn to know yourself and what is your rhythm. For example, many people um, find it helpful in beginning the period of meditation, to breathe deeply, to breathe from the diaphragm, not uh, in short, shallow breaths as we usually do, but to breathe deeply. You may like to begin by counting how many breaths in and breathe out then. Perhaps just, it may be only five or six in, five or six out, but then set aside the number. One writer has made an interesting suggestion, I find, in this matter of the rhythm. And that is when you have discovered your own rhythm of breathing in and breathing out. Let us say that it is it's six. You breathe in, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then exhale, one, two, three, four, five, six. Find a sentence that has six syllables in that sentence and repeat that, a sentence that is inspiring, a sentence that turns the attention inward and that with that sentence, rather than the numbers counting, of breathing in and breathing out, just to learn your own rhythm, move within your own rhythm. Some people find that 10 minutes is all they can meditate. And certainly to begin with, perhaps only five minutes before the mind is off on a million tangents, thinking about all sorts of things, and then we have to bring it back, and so on. Perhaps 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and so on. 
However, again, what is your particular rhythm? Well, I thought that before we come to the discussion then, perhaps we could just sit quietly together, take the posture of the back, the spine straight, the feet on the floor, the hands just at ease on the thighs, however it feels easiest. You may like to close the eyes or you may wish not to. And breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and out in a rhythmic manner. And as that rhythm is established, let me read a brief verse that may focus the thought. Serene light shining in the ground of my being, draw me to yourself. Draw me past the snares of the senses, out of the mazes of the mind. Free me from symbols, from words that I may discover the signified, the word unspoken in the darkness that veils the ground of my being. Serene light. Thank you. The Theosophical Society presents Joy Mills in a talk entitled Techniques of Achieving Alignment. Now tonight I'd like to turn to some more specific matters in the preliminary steps of meditation. Uh, probably from one point of view, we all of us engage in meditation at some time or other, at least in that kind of meditation which is perhaps at the threshold of the true discipline which is often spoken of as yoga, the real discipline of meditation. We all engage in times of certainly uh, creative brooding, of trying to discover what life is all about, or we turn within in an effort to find a solution to some problem that is concerning us. And at such a time, there seems to be a real centering of ourselves, a real focusing of all of our energies towards a, a, an understanding or towards arousing a realization that will enable us to answer the question which we may have posed our, to ourselves. Now, last week, as I say, in describing some of the features of this field of meditation, we suggested 
that the stairway of the self is composed of different densities of energy. And the chart which we have here on the constitution of man suggests a sevenfold system of the energies of consciousness, the energies which consciousness utilizes at the various levels of awareness. In beginning the practice of meditation, I suggest that we have to begin where we are and with the equipment that we have. I think often some of the problems with meditation arise simply because we are not content to begin where we are. We'd like to be something different, or we'd like to sort of overleap the personality and get at once into some other state of awareness and consciousness and forget the personality. And the part of the problem is that our personalities simply will not be forgotten. They intrude themselves in some way upon our attention. And so I suggest that we have to begin where we are and with the equipment that we have and come to terms, as it were, with ourselves, accepting ourselves as we are. We have, in one sense, if I can put it this way, to get ourselves together in order to undertake this task of meditation. Now, we may feel that we are very, very familiar with what may be called the three bottom steps of the stairway of the self, the physical, the emotional, and the mental worlds or realms of energy. But whether we are familiar with these realms or not, we really do not have a great deal of control over these areas of consciousness. That is, unless we have been engaged in the practice of meditation over a considerable period of time and have learned from either that practice or other practices to control consciousness, to control these vehicles. So the first of the preliminary steps in the practice of meditation, I suggest, may be referred to as an inner alignment, a method of bringing the brain consciousness into that state of refinement or adjustment which will permit of a contact with the immortal self, the immortal soul. I would like to suggest for any here who are perhaps beginners at meditation or who are considering beginning it, that this is perhaps the main stumbling block <laughs> because one gets so easily discouraged. Uh, one can say, you know, I've, I've been trying for a whole week to give five minutes a day and I can't seem to get my thoughts to, you know, obey me. Well, some people try for years. Some people work at it for a whole lifetime and suddenly find that some little thing, you know, they think that now I've really got it. After years of consistent practice, I really have it. And then comes along a crisis. Some thing on which we stub our mental or emotional toes and something is triggered and we find that we don't have the conscious control that we thought we had. Because it is very easy from one point of view to control our feelings, to control our actions, to control our thoughts when we sit quietly, undisturbed by any outer events in our own little area the place we have set apart for our meditation, very easy after a while, you know, and thought is very inspiring, and we can dream the loftiest visions, and we can visualize ourselves in a state of love and peace and understanding. But the real test of meditation is, as I think we all well know, whether we can take that awareness, that consciousness, into the world of everyday existence and react, act with calmness, with peace, with tranquility, and so on. So what we are talking about is this matter of alignment 
which is bringing the brain consciousness, the everyday awareness, into a state of refinement or adjustment which will permit at every moment contact with the immortal self within. The meaning of the word alignment is probably very clear. And what I propose, therefore, simply, is that the essential man, the spirit, the soul, has its habitat in a realm beyond the mind. And our aim, which is really then the aim of the whole evolution of man, is the alignment of the threefold personality with this higher self or soul. To begin with, then, these three lower bodies, vehicles, physical, emotional, and mental, this in which the personality is concerned, this is our primary concern. For only when they provide a balanced and smoothly integrated vehicle do we begin to bridge the gap between the personality and the immortal self. For example, I think it may be suggested that True abstract thought becomes possible only when the personality has achieved a reciprocal vibration to that of the soul within and is therefore sufficiently aligned to form a moderately unimpeded channel. This alignment, as we suggested earlier, is sometimes attained in moments of supreme endeavor at times of stress or intense aspiration or even in times of physical danger. We have probably, I think, all experienced moments of crisis when crisis, some crisis, faced us and we felt that we had a new strength, a supreme strength, an inner strength. The mind perhaps worked like lightning and we knew instinctively what to do. And it's always interesting the words that we use to describe such an occasion. We say of such a moment, we rose to the occasion, as though there were, in a sense, an ascent upwards. Whereas if we do something that we don't like, or we engage in, in say, an angry word, or a, a, an emotion of fear, or anxiety, we always say, we somehow fell to a lower level. We really use words that depict almost, an ascent or a descent. And I think these terms in themselves are extremely useful. Now, while this may occur, this rising to the occasion, while this may occur only rarely, we certainly do not forget that in such times we felt no fear, no anxiety, no insecurity, no doubt. We knew, and the knowing was complete and whole, and it seemed to engulf us, to take us in completely. We were fully able to meet the demands upon us, and such a memory, of course, should give us confidence that alignment is possible. If it can be done once, it can be done again, and if it can be done twice, it can be done as a continuing attitude towards life. Now, since, therefore, meditation builds, in a general sense, builds a bridge between the inner and outer aspects of life, we are talking tonight, I would suggest, about this end of the bridge and making it secure. This end of the bridge of consciousness, which is focused right here. Don't try to, you know, be an aerial, ethereal creature lost in some, some realm of, emo of, of meditation moving about the world, uh, you know, in a, in a kind of vacuum. What we're talking about is making this practical, that this does something to transform our lives right here, to lead a different kind of existence. This is a very practical matter. And so what we're talking about, as I say, is making secure this end of the bridge, making sure that on this shore where the personality is, where the the incarnation has taken place, that there is a firm structure to receive the traffic that will cross the bridge from the further side. Next week, to anticipate a bit, we will discuss concentration and imagination. And in this discussion, we are concerned with the bridge structure itself. And then in subsequent talks together, we'll talk about the other side of the bridge and what can come then across the bridge 
into the uh, consciousness at the personal <coughs> level, into the brain consciousness, into the consciousness of our daily existence. Now, to secure this end of the bridge structure, we have to consider, first of all, of course, who is doing the securing. That is, who is putting down the, the uh, various uh, posts and uh, everything else that is put down. I'm not a bridge builder, but I know posts go down. And whatever else goes down, cement and rock and all the rest, iron girders and so on, that secures this end of the bridge. Who is doing it? Who is the controller? Who really runs our lives? Or at least, who ought to run things? We have spoken in very general terms of an outer and an inner world. We also, of course, have, we might say, outer and inner selves with which we inhabit these two worlds. We think very frequently that mystery only veils the inner self and that there is a mystery that guards the inner world. And certainly there is an interdependence of these two selves of our being, and this interdependence is one of the age-long problems of mankind. But the outer self, of which we seem to know more, also has its mysteries. It is complex in its constitution, as well as its nature, and not as clearly understood as might at first be expected. How well do you know your physical mechanism? How well do you know your emotions? How well do you know your thoughts and your mental vehicle? Are you really on speaking terms with yourself? Have you ever carried on a conversation with yourself and come to know yourself? This outer self is made up of the physical body, the emotions, and the mind, each of which has its own unique characteristics, yet none of which is truly the I who is doing the bridge building. When we come to look at the matter, of course, this is obvious. We are not our bodies, not our emotions, not even our thoughts, though we act, feel, and think through them. Unfortunately, of course, we do not always remember this differentiation and often become identified with any temporary overriding urge or thought or feeling. We may even become surprised at what is going on if we set up the habit of watching our actions and motives, standing as an observer detachedly in the wings, watching the performance of the personality out there on the stage. We begin to see, if we really observe, we begin to see that different parts of ourselves are behaving in different ways. One part, for example, may be tired or lazy, while another is overactive and fretting to get on with something. Has this ever happened to you? One part may be rebellious, while another is quite content to let things be. One, may, one part may crave to pursue a particular line of action, while another part is afraid to move out and prefers to do something else. Have you ever experienced any of these, what I might call splits, inside? There are times, you know, I've, perhaps tonight, you say, I, I, it was a hard day. I, I might have said, I'd really rather, my body would really rather just sit down. I wonder if there's a way out of, you know, of being at the class tonight. I wonder if I can get someone else to take it and so on. You see, and the body says it would like to just relax and rest. But something else, you know, says, now look, you agreed to do this. You're going to be there. You know you're going to be there, and you're going to stand up and say all the proper things and so on, you see. And so these conflicts come about, do they not? We all know, I imagine, the state in which the mind persistently worries. It's like a, a terrier, a, a, a terrier that is forever um, worrying a, a bone or a ball or whatever it has. Can't let it go. Do you have a mind like this? that sort of enjoys worrying. It goes on and on and on. I wonder if this is going to happen. Perhaps that will happen. I'm fearful of this. I wonder about that and so on. It worries and worries and worries. We may have an emotional nature that is quite fearful, while all the time 
there is something else, a self that is telling us that such a state is utterly without foundation. Perhaps this has happened to you, so that you worry a while and then something comes in and says, now really, really, this is ridiculous, you know you shouldn't be worrying, there's nothing to worry about. Or we feel fearful, we hear a noise, something goes bump in the dark, you know, and we begin to feel fearful and then we you know, turn over and say, now look, this is utterly ridiculous. There's nothing in the house that can harm me. There's nothing to be afraid of. That was just a creak in the wood, an expansion of joints or whatever, and so on. And so we carry on these conversations. But the important thing to note is that we are not always in agreement with the different parts of ourselves. So we are out of alignment. How can there be true meditation, a true moving across the bridge in order to open the channel to the immortal self if we're out of alignment, if we are out of tune with ourselves. Can anything come through? It's very much like having a pipe. You say there's a channel, a pipeline, inwards. But we have fragments of this pipe in different places, as it were. And so, consequently, nothing can flow through clearly or purely. It's clogged at some point, or it's out of joint in some point. You may remember the wonderful phrase in the Bible when St. Paul complained about the warring within his members, that his mind would fasten itself in one direction, but there arose this warring within the members of his being, referring, I think, very specifically to this conflict within the personal aspects of the self. Actually, of course, we can get worn out and torn apart by the conflicts that arise within us. And to meet this situation, we have to be clear on who is the self, the I, the controlling consciousness. Well, the first part of the answer begins to appear when we realize we are not our senses or our bodies, and neither are we our minds. In a sense, I think this realization, a true realization, leads us to a confirmation of the independence of an observing self. Some psychologies, following some of the Gestalt techniques, for example, advise various techniques for coming to terms with these aspects of our nature. These are usually very simple techniques of developing an interior communication towards alignment. And so I'd like to mention just a few because you might like to try them sometime. They're very simple techniques, but I can tell you that they are effective techniques in beginning to bring about an alignment of the personal vehicles. For example, sometime try this. Just sit comfortably and close your eyes and imagine that you are looking at yourself, looking at your physical body, what clothes you have on, the expression on your face. Just look at yourself, just as though you were sitting opposite a mirror image of yourself. Just look at yourself. Visualize your, the physical body completely. How is the image sitting? What is the facial expression? How do you feel physically? And then carry on a conversation with your body. Get to know it. Listen to your own voice. Imagine what your voice sounds like and listen to it. This is an interesting sort of thing because have you ever said, I told myself such and such. Have you ever said this? Or, I tell myself I ought to do this and that. Have you ever said this? Try saying, I listen to myself. Instead of telling yourself, listen to yourself. Listen to what the physical body may be telling you. Another technique or exercise is to look at the physical body and imagination and let it tell you first what it needs. The physical body needs rest. The physical body may say, 
I think I'd like a glass of water. The physical body may say, I think it's time for dinner. Uh, the physical body may say, I'd like to uh, take a walk. I'd like to breathe some fresh air. I want, I need this. I need fresh air, I need nourishment, I need rest, I need water, and so on. Find out what it needs. And then, and this is very interesting to try, if you're really honest with yourself to get to know your physical body, ask your physical body what it wants. And see the difference between what it needs and what it wants. Do this, you know, when you're faced with the um, Christmas dinner sometime, you see. Do this uh, the next time you go into an ice cream parlor, you see. What does the body need and what does it want? And you will begin to discover a great many things about the physical body. But if it is to be a useful instrument to you, you ought to know it, shouldn't you? When you buy a new car, you don't just look at the exterior, do you? You like to know something about the engine, how it runs, how it operates. You want to know uh, something of its interior, how to change a tire, perhaps. It's a useful thing to know. What to do if you run out of gas in these days, and so on. Well, isn't the physical body far more important to know than a car? because this is your mechanism for moving about in the world of physical action. So get to know it. Be honest about it and distinguish clearly between I need as a physical body and I want. I want that second piece of chocolate. I want a Coke instead of a glass of water. I, I want to sleep until noon although I may need only a certain number of hours of sleep, and so on. It's very interesting what the body will tell you about its wants and its needs. Now, similar techniques can be applied to the emotions and to the mind. And as you do this observing, for example, try completing such sentences that begin with, I have to do thus and so. And then, I choose to do thus and so. I have to get to work today. I have to have a job in order to do thus and so. I choose to utilize my time to do thus and so. Notice again the difference between I have to and I choose to. Well, these are very simple techniques, and there are, there are others, but I'm just throwing out some of these for you to try in order for you to observe, because we all need to become familiar with our, with our vehicles. We may think, you know, that we have a very beautiful emotional vehicle, that if some clairvoyant were to look at it, surely they would tell us, you know, that it is radiant with love and and tolerance, and gentleness, and all of the marvelous virtues. We like to feel this, uh, you know, that we really are pretty nice people. And of course we are, I mean, after all, you wouldn't be here at a theosophical meeting if you weren't pretty nice people. I, I'll admit that I'll right off. We're all very nice people, <coughs> and civilized, and so on, all of this. There isn't any violence, and so on. But get to observe your emotional vehicle. Observe your mind. Is there down underneath when you say something kind to someone, a little thought that's egging you on that says, good God, I could cut his throat, you know, or something of this kind. You know, some little thought that is not quite as kindly as we express. Get to know your mind. What does it do? How does it work? Be honest about it. Well, as I say, these are just very simple techniques and exercises, and there are many others. 
but it is all to the purpose that we can come to know the vehicles that we have, the equipment that we have at our disposal. In the epic teachings of the Vedas, the great sacred scriptures of the East, the situation in regard to these vehicles or aspects of our nature is usually depicted in the symbology of the charioteer with his chariot and horses. The charioteer is the self. The chariot is the incarnation which he is leading. And the horses are the mental, emotional, and physical aspects which take the chariot forward. The great systematizer of all yoga systems, Patanjali, carries the analogy even further by proposing that the reins with which the charioteer controls his horses are the thoughts by which the self communicates with his threefold nature. And so he can hold the reins taut, he can loosen them, he can permit the horses to go off on their own, and so on. Plato, in the Greek tradition of the Western world, also used the analogy of the charioteer. And in one of the dialogues, he remarks with great frustration, as might be expected, there is a great deal of trouble in managing the horses. Quite an understatement, I think, if we've ever tried to manage these horses, really. The analogy, I think, of the vehicles as horses is a very good one. For actually, these three aspects of our nature are, as I've suggested earlier, definite energies. And we need to be aware that we have three very different types of energy to handle. Each of these elements in our nature has its own characteristics and qualities, vices and virtues that we may need to curb or to use. Each has its own drives, tendencies, motives, and demands. And these we have to learn to handle for constructive purposes and in the service of the self, neither giving them full uh, freedom to move in any direction, nor holding them under such restriction that the normal needs of the vehicles are not met. Each, of course, of the horses may pull in a different direction. Not always, for example, do thought and emotion go hand in hand. And so we have to perform, in one sense, a real balancing act to stand poised in the chariot of life, holding the reins of these three rather willful horses and determining the direction they will go. And yet we are dependent on these energies or elements at our disposal, on the horses we have, and their various pulls must be assessed and adjusted and our, our own vision harnessed to what may be called their potential horsepower because this is the energy, the horsepower available for this incarnation. And its proper utilization enables us to live that kind of life which is the totally integrated life and permits the inner vision to come through and influence our lives. In all of this, of course, the strong hand of the one in charge is vitally needed, the guiding hand of the charioteer who holds the reins and sees the road that the horses are to move along. Now, one other point become, before we come to another exercise. We and we alone must bear full responsibility for the elements in our charge. Let us not say, he made me think that. He drove me to that anger. He caused that anxiety. He brought about that fear. Something outside, an external source, impelled me to do that, to move in that direction, to act in that manner. The horses are our own driving energy, but we have created the horses. We have built them, fashioned them in accordance with our own past actions, feelings, and thoughts. And just as we are training the horses of our personality now, so are we building, as it were, creating, shaping, fashioning the type of horsepower we will have in future incarnations. We alone bear the responsibility. And this is why, in one sense, 
You see, in talking about meditation, in suggesting some of these techniques, in suggesting the benefits, in suggesting the need for alignment, it's very true, according to the old axiom, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And so I can present this to you, but it is up to each one of us to determine whether we'll let the horse drink of the water, as it were, and take advantage of the opportunity offered by a knowledge of the techniques of meditation. And so what we need to begin with is a technique for bringing these elements into alignment so that they act in harmony and are responsive to the charioteer, the immortal self. So I suggest we might try together, very briefly, an exercise in alignment, an exercise in disidentification along with alignment, and see if we individually can begin to discover what are some of the clues as we go through this very brief exercise together. So I'll ask you to just sit comfortably. If you don't want to participate, that's all right. But if you would like to, just sit comfortably. I suggest you close your eyes so that you, by that action, you shut out all the external stimuli that may be impinging upon us. And first, make a deliberate effort to relax all physical tension. Think right through the body from head to, to foot, relaxing each part. Nervous tension must be consciously released. And while physically poised, we are at rest. I have a body, but I am not my body. Whatever the condition of my body, well or ill, rested or tired, it is not my real I. My body is my precious instrument of experience and of action, but it is only an instrument. I treat it well, I breathe in and breathe out. I have a body, but I am not my body. Now shift the polarization to the emotional level. Draw in the consciousness and try to stand at a still central point. The emotional body can be imagined as a smooth and limpid pool with a quiet, reflective quality which will offer no impediment to alignment with the mind. I have emotions, but I am not my emotions. They are countless, contradictory, changing, and yet I know that I always remain I in times of hope or despair, in joy or pain, in a state of irritation or calm. I have emotions, but I am not my emotions.
Now turn the consciousness to the mind. I am a point of focused thought. I have an intellect, but I am not my intellect. It is more or less developed and active. It is undisciplined but teachable. It is an organ of knowledge, both of the outer and the inner worlds. But it is not myself. I have a mind, but I am not my mind. I am a center of pure self-consciousness, a center of will, silent, at peace, calm. I am the constant and unchanging self. From that center, unchanging, constant, I turn outwards to the mind, an instrument to use in thinking. I return to the emotions an instrument to use in feeling. I return to the body, an instrument to use in action. Thank you for trying that with me. This is again just a very simple but preliminary. Sometimes after one has been engaged in meditation for some years, it's like sort of practicing the scales for a pianist, a warm-up, as it were, to be sure the alignment is present, to be sure one is aware of the body, the feelings, the thoughts, and that these are instruments. And just as the accomplished pianist never forgets his scales, but often does use them as for warm-up practice, so the individual seated in the calm center of meditation never forgets the preliminary steps and often uses them as the pianist does his scales. To be sure the attunement is there, the harmony is there, the alignment is present. This concludes Techniques of Achieving Alignment by Joy Mills. The Theosophical Society presents Joy Mills in a talk entitled From Concentration to Imagination. Now we come tonight then in our series of studies on meditation to what I think are two most important aspects of the subject, two factors which all writers, East and West, every book on meditation, whether it deals with the Western systems of meditation, the systems of Christian meditation, uh, the various uh, systems within the Western types of meditation, or the Eastern types of meditation, Buddhist, Hindu, Chinese, whatever. All books on meditation agree are two very essential factors that must be involved in the systematic and orderly practice of meditation. And anyone who has attempted meditation at all, 
who has said, I'm at least going to try and engage in meditation immediately comes up against these. These aspects are known first as concentration, the ability to focus the mind on a given object or idea for a given period of time, concentration, and imagination or visualization, the ability to direct the mind. Now this isn't just the again, um, flight of imagination, where one gives free reign to whatever arises. But imagination coupled with concentration in the directed purposefulness of it, so that it is imagination as an ability to direct the mind to build pictures or images in accordance with the command of the immortal self or under the direction of the will. And tonight I want to try uh, some experiments in this and have you participate and see uh, how far we can go in this. But first, uh, let's look at these two aspects a little bit. Concentration. I suppose there are very few people who have no difficulty at all in concentrating the mind. Now, uh, I suppose it's possible that some of you have minds well-disciplined, well-controlled, so that you never think a thought, you never have a thought pass through your mind that you have not determined will be present. But uh, if you have, that's marvelous. You should be giving the talk and not I. <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose for most of us, there are times when we find ourselves thinking about something that we never intended to think about. Or we find ourselves far, far removed from the subject we may have chosen to meditate on or to contemplate. Uh, perhaps, for example, even since I began speaking, which is uh, about 10 minutes ago, eight minutes ago, I suppose you have heard and listened attentively to every single word I have said. Nowhere along the line in the last eight or 10 minutes has your mind sort of wandered off somewhere. That's wonderful. <laughs> I knew I had your rapt and complete and whole attention, <laughs> you know. But I suspect that your mind has been having its own adventures and that uh, you may have heard, and our attention span varies. This psychologist knows, so you may have heard some words now and then and suddenly your mind was off, perhaps carrying on a little argument with me, saying, uh, you know, I wish you'd get on with it or... <laughs> This is repeating stuff I've already heard, and how did I get myself into this tonight? Well, it's cozy for a while, so I'll stay, but I wonder how it's going to be going home, and so on. Your mind has been doing all sorts of things. Well, in one sense, this is all right, because the whole evolutionary development of the mind has taken place in a way that fosters a certain speed of response to stimuli. So this is why I say, in a certain sense, this is all right, that you have minds, that we all have minds that are quick to respond, to move, that have a real speed of mobility. Because the whole evolutionary process in the development of the mind is the bringing about of a condition in consciousness in which there is this kind of speed of response and an, a, a mobility of the mind. That is, the mind has become accustomed to moving swiftly from stimulus to stimulus, alert to sensations from without, turning attention quickly from one thing to another. Now this has been part of the evolutionary process because it is part of the process of protection, protection of, one, of one's incarnation, for example. You say, if you, if you walk out into the street, 
and you are so concentrated on spiritual liberation that you fail to hear the automobile horn that's suddenly honking at you, you are in danger of losing a rather precious possession, <laughs> your body, <laughs> an incarnation. <coughs> so it is well that the mind has become alert, you see. So this is nothing against it, but we are at a stage in evolution in consciousness where now we have to begin to, tr to tame the mind, to train it, to bring it under control of something else, the self, the immortal part of our being, you see. Without losing this mobility, this extreme responsiveness to outer stimuli, but to learn to discriminate between the times when it is useful for the mind to respond in that manner to outer stimuli, and those times when we want to turn off all outer sensation, as it were, and not regard it, not regard the outer sensations. And here is the tough battle, isn't it, you see? Because when you sit down to meditate and begin the practice of concentration as the first step in meditation, the mind is still going on and responding to outer sensations. A fly rests at the tip of your nose, you see. Now, the mind has been customarily in the habit of sending of, of, of reacting, you see, so that a sense uh, stimulus is present and there is an automatic reaction to brush the fly off. Well, we'll come to some of this and I have a story to tell you a little later on. But here we are confronted with the need then to quiet the mind, to help it stay in place, as it were, to focus on one thing to the exclusion of all other outer stimuli and sensations. Dr. Annie Besant, in her superb analysis and very helpful survey of this entire process, and those of you who may not be familiar with it, I certainly recommend her little book, Thought Power, which is very basic and very helpful and begins right at the beginning, as it were, with this whole matter of concentration and gives some marvelous clues to it. She comments on this difficulty, which confronts us by saying this, while the mind is collecting materials for thought, extreme mobility is an advantage. And for many, many lives, the mind grows through this mobility. This is what I've been saying earlier. The stoppage of this habit of running outwards in every direction, the imposition of fixed attention on a single point this change naturally comes with a jar and a shock. I think it's marvelous, it, it, because it does. The mind is, huh, I've got to be, you know, who thinks he's going to control me, says the mind, as it were. And the mind plunges wildly like an unbroken horse when it first feels the bit. And you remember last week, we used the analogy, which is used in so many books, of the charioteer and the horses, the horses being the three horses should be driven in tandem, the three horses of the mind, the emotions, and the body should be driven in unison, neither one going out of kilter, as it were, and carrying the chariot of the incarnate, of the whole purpose of existence off into one line or another. So concentration is simply a mental challenge. In the East, the mind has often been compared to a monkey which I think is a marvelous comparison, with its tendency to leap about from branch to branch and follow an endless pattern of activity. And it's in, interesting in the West, in the Greek tradition, the very word psyche, which is the Greek term for that whole mental emotional principle, which has often been called the soul, is the Greek word for butterfly. So you can have a monkey or a butterfly, whichever you prefer. 
A tendency, in other words, of restless activity and to leap about. This analogy, of course, I think not only illustrates the restlessness of the mind, but also indicates the fact that the mind is a real entity, a part of ourselves with its own identity and with its own inclinations, sometimes acting rather independently from the instructions we may give it, as we well know. So, as has been suggested by some writers, it may be necessary to induce meditation, and it, it, in order to get started in meditation, to sort of play games with the mind, sort of get it into the, the proper frame of doing what we think it ought to do, and to play with the mind with skill rather than bludgeon it into obedience. Because obviously, you cannot bludgeon it without damaging its power to be a useful instrument. You cannot drug it, you see, and say, well, look, my mind is so active and I want it to do what I think it ought to, so I will simply drug it. You say, I'll put it to sleep. Well, a lot of good the mind is then. You're, you're not in a state of meditation, you're in a state of drugged sleep, <laughs> you say, and so be honest about it. So, you have to use the mind and use its, its mobility and its restlessness with skill. Just as, you see, the best racehorse is not one that's, uh, you know, ready for the glue factory sort of thing, not the old, you know, uh, horse that can hardly limp around but obeys you constantly. It's the horse that is, that is all primed and alert, but well directed. Ernest Wood, for example, in his excellent book on concentration, has pointed out that in all of these matters, we must do no violence. As he says, we are not hard and lofty masters whipping a wild animal into sullen obedience. To command the mind is one thing. To teach it as a willing and happy pupil, continually finding new delights of experience in healthy functioning, is quite another. So, how do we get the mind to play with us, you know, to do what we want, as it were? How can we, I suppose, trick it, you know? Catch its attention, you see. Capture its attention. It may be useful, I think, to, at this, uh, in, in order to uh, engage in the practice of concentration, to intrigue the mind by presenting it with an object or idea which will elicit its cooperation because the mind is interested in whatever the idea happens to be. Actually, you see, there are two kinds of concentration. One is spontaneous and automatic, and the other is deliberate and controlled. And perhaps the easy way is to move from what may be called deliberate and spontaneous concentration to discover what the mind does then and move from that to deliberate and controlled concentration. We can begin with the one, in other words, and gradually develop the other. For example, if you are convinced that you have a very good control over the mind because you find it very easy to focus on a subject of interest to you, then determine to concentrate for five minutes on a subject that has no interest for you. You will discover a great number of things about your mind. Of course you have good control in concentration on a subject that is of intense interest to you. Time goes by, you know, you lose sight of all external things. The telephone can ring and you don't hear it. Dinner is called and you don't come, you're not hungry, it never enters your mind. But concentrate for five minutes on something that has no interest whatsoever to you, and you're sure it's time for dinner half an hour ago, and all sorts of things, the window ought to be opened or closed, or various things need to be done. I know, I, I have a trick when I'm writing something that I have to write, 
As many of you know, I, I write each month in our monthly journal, The American Theosophist. And sometimes I'm up against a deadline. Our editor here, Virginia Hansen, reminds me that it's due. And so I sit at my typewriter, and I have an idea, but I've got to focus it down and, and work it out, you know. And this is a long, laborious process at times of concentration. So I suddenly see that my typewriter is dirty, and so I take out my brush, and I brush out all of the things, you know. And uh, then I think, well, maybe if I had another piece of paper, and then I realize the room is too warm, and I get up and move over and turn off the heat. And then I come back and I look at the paper, and finally, you know, well, these are the ways we, we do. You know, so I'm honest, I'll share with you what I do. And uh, I'm not asking you to share what you do. But, <laughs> but this is what goes on. Now, you may find, of course, if you really look at this matter of the difference between concentration when you're absorbed in a subject and concentration when you just can't get your mind to focus on it, that there is present or absent one factor. In other words, that there is one factor we could say that is present in spontaneous concentration that is always present no matter what the subject and that is some strong emotional or mental motivation. A desire, an interest, excitement, and so on. All of these pull the mind, don't they, to a focus. As it were, pull our thoughts to a focus. And I think this may be the clue in helping us with the development of concentration as a deliberate and controlled practice. Now, how can we invest the subject on which we consciously determine to focus the mind in concentration? How can we invest it with a strong motive? This is the heart of the question in getting ourselves into the initial stages of concentration. Here, I suggest, is where imagination or visualization come into play and may be very helpful in enticing the mind to concentrating. Now, this is not yet meditation. This is a first step, however. It is a preliminary step and an essential step on the stairway of meditation. In one sense, it's rather like telling the, the willful and restless child that if he will focus on his homework and really get it done, he will be rewarded with a certain amount of freedom after that. So it's telling the mind, now, please, just for 10 minutes, you're going to focus. You're going to consider this subject or object, whatever it may be. And then after that, I'll let you, you know, sort of go outdoors and play. Think about anything you want to think about. Concentrate for a while and then go about your usual activity. So it is that deliberate, controlled concentration is carried out under the orders of the self, and there may be very little emotional urge or desire behind it. In fact, the order may even be rather dull and unattractive to the mind. But the determination has come from a deeper center within. And this, of course, is the determination that must be present all along the way in learning to meditate and in the practice of meditation. Well, we might use as an example let us say that I place before you a number of random lines, just random lines and shapes, and I ask you to concentrate on them. Here is, uh, uh, for example, I'm going to just show it to you, you see, and I'm going to say these random shapes you are to concentrate on. You are to concentrate on them so that you can recall precisely what they look like. This is one of the exercises in concentration, to look at something, let us say, for five minutes, and then to be able to reproduce it, you see. Now that's rather difficult, isn't it? And this is rather meaningless, isn't it? 
But if I suggest to you first, if you can take these two figures here, these, this uh, rectangle and this uh, uh, rhomboid shape, and you begin to imagine something. Can, you, can your mind imagine what they are? Can, what do you see there? Let's say this, just this rectangular shape. What do you see? What do you imagine as you look at that? An envelope? Hmm? A coin purse? A bow tie and a striped shirt. You see, the imagination really can move out, can't it? Anything else that anyone sees there? A candle and flame. That's interesting. A hat. A child. A child. A wall. A wall. A A dressing table with a mirror. Now, having done that, your interest is aroused, isn't it? And how much easier to concentrate through imagination so that when I put this down, you are more likely to recall the shape there, are you not? Now that you have invested it with some imaginative quality, characteristics. Do you see? This is how imagination can be used to pull along the mind towards concentration. Very simple little exercise, but perhaps useful to illustrate this, at least. Because in the process of this exercise of imagination, you find yourself concentrating. And all of you, the moment I said, imagine what that might be, began concentrating on it, seeing it, really seeing it, really focusing. And so all of your thoughts were pulled together towards that particular set of lines and drawing and so on. Now, of course, when we come to abstract and spiritual matters, there is an intangible quality which makes it genuinely difficult for the mind to find something to take hold of, something it can really focus on. Yet I think even here we can gain a certain aid from the emotional nature through aspiration, through dedication and other altruistic motives. And the exercise I'd like to try a little bit later uh, towards the close uh, will illustrate this, I think. But a few other points first. I think it must always be remembered that concentration is not a state of passivity. And this little exercise indicates that. <coughs> it's not a state of passivity. It's a state of intense and regulated activity. You were pulled, as it were, Thought was pulled towards the image which I presented to you. And so it resembles, concentration resembles in the mental world, as Dr. Besant has pointed out, the gathering up of the muscles for a leap in the physical world. It resembles this. And I think the analogy is quite apt. For just as when one focuses or draws together all of one's physical energies to do something, say, to run or to leap or whatever it may be. One gathers all one's physical resources and then afterwards there is a release and a feeling of fatigue. So very often there comes a physical fatigue after prolonged concentration. One of the reasons why it should not be engaged in too long because the physical body also needs its due, as it were. It must be given its attention. It must, its needs must be provided for. And so often there comes about this sort of interior, what has been called a kind of biological clock that alerts us to the fact that the body is tired. Concentration now may cease because the body has actually felt its reaction in terms of a fatigue. Another point I think should not be overlooked, 
Some types of mind, uh, minds are by nature perhaps more diffuse and concentration is more difficult, therefore for some people than for others. And I think this shouldn't bother us. We say, I've been trying to concentrate for years and someone, your neighbor says, gee, that's so simple. I really have got that step down. I can immediately concentrate. I think we should just try to assess our own abilities and capacities, our strengths and weaknesses, and take courage from our assets and work then at whatever our deficiencies seem to be. For example, perhaps it may be necessary for those who tend to be dreamy and vague to work at developing their minds along objective lines, to train themselves to a precision of observation through concentration a real precision of observation, while those who are over-objective, who are inclined to be critical, inclined to be very precise, may need to cultivate a little more imagination and ability to think abstractly so that we balance these factors. Of course, a very simple exercise in concentration is looking at a picture or a building and then jotting down all the details remembered from that perception. This should be done, however, with some precision, checking the results. Go back and look. What did you leave out? Or evoke, if you are the very precise kind, evoke a picture in your imagination. Hold it steadily in the mind's eye and build in carefully every detail and then let go of it, withdraw from it. Such an exercise, of course, <laughs> evokes the power to visualize as well as to concentrate and recall. And in this, of course, one comes up against some of the problems of imagination, which has its own problems, too. The tricks that imagination can play upon us if we are not alert. And so the imagination, which is really very important, because in its creativity, it is one of the valuable instruments we have for meditation, can also play tricks on us, aiding and abetting the mind in its desire to escape from concentration. It can aid concentration, and it can also aid the mind to escape from concentration, as we can wander off. So imagination is both reproductive and creative, and it can function at several levels. Imagination has links with sensation, with feeling, with thinking, and with intuition. And creative imagination can be trained. A simple exercise, for example, in creative imagination is to picture a triangle. Can all of you picture a triangle? Close your eyes and see a triangle? Very simple. Now, extend the lines to form a diamond. Can you do that? You see the diamond? And you hold the diamond steady? And now deepen that image until it is three-dimensional and becomes a many-faceted jewel. Can you see that? This is just a very simple exercise. Come back. You can then take the three-dimensional effect out and come back to the diamond, back to the triangle, and let it dissipate. This is a marvelous little exercise in training the mind and imagination, you see. Very simple. The essence of any exercise in imagination, however, is that we should not be carried away by the imaginative faculty. Again, we determine where we go the triangle, to the diamond, to the jewel, and back. Not off, you know, diamond searching in South Africa, for example, <laughs> or in the jewelry store, all of that, you see. We have determined. In other words, we select what is to be imagined, and the whole process is kept under our command. And this, of course, is the central point in all meditation. As we have pointed out, Earlier in our discussions, the self must be in command, consciously so, with discrimination always present 
the power to choose. So, of course, in this, the will comes into play. Will which involves motive also. And the will is really the divine aspect in man which puts him in rapport, in harmony with the very essence of life, with reality, with the purpose synthesizing all life. So all exercises in imagination and concentration, I suggest, ultimately involve the will. So we may need to train the will or rather to permit that immortal self to come through and use the mind as a trained instrument. Actually, as I say, it's not so much a training of the will, which ends up being a won't power, you know, I won't do this and I won't do that sort of thing, as a permitting of the essence of will, the essence of what we are truly, the essence of the self, to take hold of our lives and direct our existence in a purposeful manner. And as we've said earlier in earlier meetings, for that we need the coordination of the physical body trained to respond, the emotions trained also to respond, not reacting, but feeling as we determine they will feel, and the mind. That coordination can be achieved, I suggest, by learning some of the principles of concentration. And this brings us back to the focus in the mind. One of the great Western uh, students of, of meditation and concentration, uh, giving rise to much of the system of the great Christian mystics of the medieval period, St. Dionysius wrote that three things were required to attain spiritual vision. The first, he said, the first is possession of one's mind. Are we in possession of the mind? To learn to concentrate is to be in possession of one's mind. The second is a mind that is free, which means simply a mind that is not pulled by the emotions, not subject to uh, the emotional swamping that can take place. Uh, not subject to prejudice, a mind that is truly free. And the third is a mind that can see. That is, a mind that looks clearly at all things, objectively and, and frankly and honestly. And as he says, how can we acquire this speculative mind? By a habit of mental concentration. Very simple, very simple, you see. Again and again in Eastern methods as well as in Western schools, wherever meditation is taught or practiced, the art of concentration built up with a well-trained power of imagination is basic. Something of the difficulty of the task, and I told you earlier on I'd tell you a little story, and here I'd like to inject it in this matter of, of the well-trained mind. Something of the difficulty of the task is illustrated by a story that Alexandra David Neal, uh, who did a considerable amount of traveling in the East and has written several works on Tibetan mysticism, uh, she tells about the method used to ascertain the degree of concentration achieved by the Tibetan novice. In one of the schools in Tibet, it is customary in training the pupil to concentrate to place a small burning lamp, burning with butter, on the head of the novice. Now such a lamp with butter in it burns for a very long time. But of course, the slightest movement of the pupil will cause the lamp, as it's a rather small butter lamp. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen these butter lamps, which are very, you can get them in India as well as in Tibet. Uh, a slightest movement, it would fall off. Well, in this particular case, the lama or teacher had placed the burning butter lamp on the head of his student, his pupil, and he went off. And the pupil meditated, concentrated, all night. And towards morning, the lamp had gone out. The butter had been exhausted. So he took it from his head and put it on the ground. And when his teacher came back, the Lama naturally questioned him. 
as to why the lamp was no longer on his head. Why was it there on the ground? And he said, well, I, the, the flame had stopped. It was no longer burning. I had had it on my head almost the whole night, and the flame was out, so I put it on the ground. And of course, the Lama retorted sternly, how could you know that the lamp went out, or even that you had a lamp on your head, if you had reached too, true concentration of the mind? <laughs> so, of course, this is what happens, you say. We do become aware of other things. We respond to other things. And concentration, if there had been absolute concentration, he would not have even known there was a lamp on his head, let alone that the butter in it had been exhausted. Well, I'd like to try an exercise then with you as our meditation this evening. So if you would take a comfortable position, and I'd like you to, for this, to close your eyes. Breathe deeply but naturally so that there is established a rhythm in the physical body. And now imagine a quiet corner on a summer's day. It is warm. You are going to build a picture of a garden. See the garden. A soft green lawn. Rose bushes. In the distance, a little further away, a lake, blue, quiet. Opposite the lake, surrounding the garden, are tall trees. See those trees. Now in this garden, put a bench, a stone bench. Now you enter the garden. Seat yourself on the bench. Feel the warmth and light of the sun. Listen to the sounds of the day, summer. Smell the scent on the air. There is peace in the garden. Now dismiss the picture. No garden, no bench, no you. Calm, peace, quiet, rain. Retain only the awareness of peace. Now bring that quality of peace into your mind, into your emotions. into your body, your whole being vibrant with peace.
and send that peace forth upon the world. Peace to all that lives. Thank you. The Theosophical Society presents Joy Mills in a talk entitled Reflective Meditation. Tonight, I'd like to take up what has been called reflective meditation, which has to do really with thought processes. Reflective re meditation is rational. And I'll comment, and it may be that in the question period, you will have points to raise on this, but I would like to comment right at the outset that one reason for emphasizing this particular category <clears throat> of rational med meditation, reflective meditation using thought processes, is that this is particularly adapted to the Western body. And this, I think, we must remember. The Theosophical Philosophy, as I'm sure all of you know, suggests the feasibility, the, the um, validity of the concept of reincarnation. So that from that point of view, there are incarnations when we have Eastern bodies, there are incarnations when we have Western bodies. Now, I am also convinced that when one is in a Western body or in an Eastern body, whichever body one is in, as it were, male, female, uh, East, West, uh, whatever, there is a purpose, there is something to be learned from incarnation in that particular body. And therefore, there are techniques, there are disciplines, there are uh, ways of using the body that are particularly well adapted to the type of vehicle one has. And uh, Often, mistakes are seriously made and difficulties can arise when one attempts to do something that really is not, if we can call it this, the dharma of the physical body that one has. That is, the, the whole purpose of the body which one has. And in the West, we are accustomed to thinking. Thinking is the rational function is very much emphasized in the West, then this can be the tool by which we enter into the whole realm of meditation. And we should use it. And I can tell you there are serious cases where this has been forgotten, and either the, the idea that you can bypass the mind or that we don't need it in some way, and the whole mental process, which includes discrimination, which includes choice, which includes a fine-tuned instrument that is able to look at it and de make decisions as to the validity of an experience, of an insight, of an intuition, where that has been set aside and really serious difficulties have arisen. Well, I won't go into the negative aspects, but this broad type of reflective meditation actually is found even in many of the Eastern schools. In some of the formalized meditations of Mahayana Buddhism, it is very much present, very much present. The rational faculty is there. But it is distinguished from what has been called the contemplative intuitive type of meditation. Well, perhaps the simplest form of meditation, and therefore the best to start with, as I say, because it entails something with which we're familiar, thinking, I, I think we all think, uh, at least something goes on that passes for thinking, uh, we hope we're, we're engaged in it. Uh, it entails, this entails the ordinary active, although controlled thinking to which the mind is accustomed is reflective meditation. One aspect of this which we shall also examine tonight, and I I see it as a kind of rising tide, as it were, 
in which we move in in a certain direction and then move out in another in in a another direction we can look at it in various ways but one aspect that we need to examine involves what has been called receptive meditation reflective receptive these really are two wings of the same bird that soars two wings of the bird of meditation but this should not be thought of as in any way a negative form of meditation when i say receptive please do not think of it as negative. Rather, that out of the achievement of reflective meditation, the mind is then held still, poised. We'll try one at the end tonight, see what we can do in a group. But the mind is held still and poised, alert to receive a light on a subject, to catch an inspiration or grasp a new realization and this might be compared to listening for something which is far away and which therefore demands the mustering of complete attention. So it may be seen that reflective meditation, as I say, consists of two parts, as it were. And we will deal with these so far as we can separate them, although really they are very much one. So to begin then, reflective meditation takes up from the point we have reached in concentration and imagination. These were the preliminary steps. Concentration, imagination. A subject is chosen, let us say a quality, like serenity. I presume this is a quality we all would like to have. Perhaps this is a quality you already have, so we'll then try another quality, but because uh, I think I need serenity, I come up with this, you see. Uh, let us take this quality of serenity. To reflect upon this, first we concentrate upon it. And then we imagine perhaps a serene lake. And reflect upon it then means to begin to consider everything we can about it, its meaning, its value, its significance, what it is able to bring about. The first requirement in this reflective meditation is to watch the thinking processes. Keep a check on them. Notice immediately if the mind begins to wander and patiently bring it back to the central theme of serenity, the theme which we have chosen to ref uh, on which to reflect. We can take courage at the outset. Our minds are likely to wander. Don't worry. They generally do. And let's not fool ourselves, let's be absolutely honest. When the mind begins to wander, bring it back. But we can take courage, I think, from a writer such as Sri Krishna Prem, who has written in the book, The Yoga of the Bhagavad Gita, for countless ages, the mind has been turned outwards and has been given a free rein to attach itself to objects of desire. And it is not to be expected that it will be possible to wrench it away from them at once. An understatement, if ever I read one. A bamboo that has long borne a weight will not be straightened merely by its removal. Strenuous effort will be required to neutralize the acquired bend. So it is with the mind. And I think this is a very apt illustration. If you notice a, a fir tree with a heavy load of snow upon it. And when the snow is gone, perhaps the tree still bends and only gradually does it begin to resume its upright state, doesn't it? And sometimes one sees a windswept tree which is moved out and then life forces it up and then it moves, then it bends over again and so on. It's interesting to watch this. Uh, on a seashore, for example, or on a, a cliff where, where the winds sweep by. So here the use of will comes in. And we alluded to this aspect of our subject last week, you will recall. The task before us then involves a steady brooding on the subject. And all aspects of it must be included. The meanings of serenity. What does serenity imply? What is its significance? What are serene circumstances? 
What does it mean for me to be serene? What is it for the physical body to be serene? What is it for the emotions to be serene? What is meant by a serene mind? All aspects are examined. The implications. Does serenity mean, does this imply that I will not be active in the world? Does serenity imply that I will let people just walk over me? That I will just be a limp dish rag? Does serenity imply a positive state in which I act? What does serenity mean? All of these aspects, you see, of the subject are explored in the reflective meditation. Unless we do that, we're just doing our ordinary thinking. But this is a deeper probing, and we must not permit any jumping to conclusions or one-sided examination. Neither should we, be per uh, should we permit our thinking to be colored by emotions of any kind. Can we look at this quality impersonally, without involvement in it, unemotionally? Just look at it, examine it, turn it around, you see, in thought. The whole process must be kept under control. Now the second requirement, this is the first requirement, to keep it under control, to note where the mind goes and bring it back, keep it around this subject. The second requirement in this type of meditation is persistence. And this is difficult because we're not really noted for being very persistent, except in something we want. Then we become, of course, we say we're persistent and all of our friends say we're stubborn. So it depends on, you know, who is doing what, you see. I say I am persistent. You may say I'm just being stubborn. But when it comes to something we don't want very much, for example, we may feel that, well, we've worked at this for a week or two weeks, you know. By this time, my golly, if we're not serene, we never will be, sort of thing. Uh, we've examined it all we can and so on. And uh, we still react. Uh, something comes along and it upsets us and we're not very serene. And so, well, let's let that go. Let's, let's turn to something easier, we say, you see. So the second requirement is persistence. We are apt to think even that we've uncovered all there is to be known about a subject, but we certainly must persist through this phase, which is really a very normal mental reaction. I've discovered everything there is to be known about serenity. I know all about it. Of course, I can't put it into action. Of course, I'm not a very serene person, but I know everything there is to be known about serenity. Well, do we really? Have we really examined it? Let us say, you see, that serenity is our topic. Devote at least a month to this. Sometimes people have been known to devote years to just one quality, because one quality can be the doorway to every other quality, every other aspect of, of life. Serenity can open the door to love, to courage, to fearlessness, to tact, to all of these qualities that you might be able to list, to discrimination. It can open the door to all of these. So perhaps we could take serenity as the subject of reflective meditation for an entire incarnation, and it would lead you to all of the others. But certainly take something like this for a sufficient length of time. Of course, sometimes after one or two periods of meditation, we feel there's nothing more to explore, and we're bored with the topic. And this is where there is a normal mental reaction. I want to meditate on something exciting. I'd like to meditate on the chakras. I'd like to meditate on, on something really exciting that's going to, to do something, you see. And so we're bored. The mind wants some new feed it's the horse that's always asking for a new brand of oats to be handed in, sort of, uh, you say. So, so we, we want this excitement. Can we persist through this? 
To re-stimulate attention, it may be useful to read something on the subject. Look it up in the dictionary. The, or list some questions on it. I was, just today I was reading a book that I picked up in a bookstore last evening, and I came on a new idea, for example, with regard to truth. Uh, this is just an illustration how sometimes one's reading can enrich a reflective meditation. Uh, you say, oh, not that I know all about truth or ever thought I did, but suddenly I had a new insight because I learned that the Greek word for truth, or the word that Plato used in his dialogues for truth, is the Greek word alithia, which is a not forgetting. Lethe, of course, was the river of forgetfulness that everyone crosses after uh, the end of an incarnation. You may remember the Greek mythology and so on. You get driven, uh, rowed across the river of Lethe. But truth, the word that has been translated as truth, Plato used the term a lethe, a not forgetting. Because from the Platonic point of view, truth was the original condition in which consciousness existed. It was the pure state of consciousness, the purity of consciousness. And we have, we, we think, you see, in the Greek mythology of going across the river Lethe after death, but incarnation is crossing the river Lethe this direction, as it were, you see. And so the not forgetting, to remember, is truth. Well, that cast a whole new light on it for me, suddenly. And this is what I mean, that one can read something that re-stimulates attention and which reflective meditation can then take place. This is just a simple little illustration. It happens to be fresh in my mind because I came upon it this morning. So perhaps we can list some of the questions on the subject that we have chosen for our reflective meditation to which we'd like to have answers and take them within and see if we can examine this subject from the, the point of view of these questions. Reach into the depths of whatever topic is chosen for reflective meditation. After all, this is why we meditate, not just to sit and think, not just to daydream, but to go into, to go below the surface, to go into a matter in depth, and to reach that still point of the immortal self which can cast light upon the subject. And that is invited by this kind of reflective state that is induced. And so we probe behind the apparent, and we find out the elements we might otherwise never know were present. No matter how simple the topic we have, uh, the, that we may have selected for our meditation, if we persist with it, there are always new significances to be discovered and deeper fields of comprehension to be arrived at. There is a, a kind of apocryphal story within the theosophical movement of the occasion when, uh, that I say apocryphal because I don't know that it's ever been documented, may, not, may be true, may be not true, but it makes an interesting story of when Dr. Annie Besant, one of the great leaders of the Theosophical Society, a, a, very, a, a magnificent woman who was involved in a great number of social causes and humanitarian causes, when she learned about the existence of this philosophy, theosophy, through being given the two volumes of the secret doctrine to review. She said she must know the author, and she went to H.P. Blavatsky, met her, and asked her to teach her, teach Dr. Besant how to meditate. And she wanted to learn all of this. She wanted to come at the truth at once, you know. So will you teach me to meditate? And it is said, that H.P. Uh, Blavatsky threw a matchbox on the table and said, meditate on that. Now, this is a very ordinary, common object. But what is a matchbox? I don't know what kind this was, but let us say that it was one of these small matchboxes. Can one meditate on a matchbox? Why not? Have you ever thought 
of the symbolism of the matchbox? It's a rectangle. It has height and depth and dimensions. Perhaps that's the physical body. What's inside the matchbox? Matches. What has to be done with what is inside? It has to be lit. Isn't perhaps within the temple of the physical body is the living spark. Have you ever thought about meditating on a matchbox, you see? Reflect upon it. The symbolism is tremendous. Who lights the match? You do. You have to do it. Nobody else is going to do it, you see, when that's given to you. So you must light the spark within. And what more beautiful symbol than the fire burning within because you have lit it? Well, there are all sorts of things one can meditate on, and everything is given. The matchbox usually has on the side of it a little rough abrasive part so that the capacity for the match to come alight is there as part of the box. You say, everyone can go on with the symbolism, all kinds of things. I don't know that this is what happened, but it seemed to me that there is much in any object to reflect upon. Every object in the universe is symbolic in some way. It is a symbol. Every word is a symbol. The word serenity is not the quality serenity. It is a symbol of that. So think of it. How does it sound? You say, tranquility and so on. Think of these things and examine them. And this is what is meant by reflective meditation. In his very excellent book on meditation, Concentration and Meditation is the title of it, Christmas Humphreys, who of course is a great Buddhist scholar and has written extensively on Buddhism and uh, the Buddhist way of life and Buddhist meditation and so on, has described seven types of reflective meditation. And these are very interesting to note. On passing through the bodies, and we're going to try a little bit of this, on things as they really are. This is a marvelous type of reflective meditation. Meditation on things as they really are. Not as we wish them to be, as we think they are, or they think we think they ought to be, as they were yesterday or last year, or anything of that sort, but on things as they are. On, on dispassion on motive, on the doctrines of religion, on the self, and on analogy. And these are very interesting to follow, these seven types. But in each case, whatever type is followed, the period of reflection is followed by the creation, if it is true reflection. Now, this is not just idly thinking about it, matchboxes and serenity and whatnot, you see. But the period of reflection, if it is truly reflection, is followed by the creation of an unimpeded channel between the physical brain and the higher or inner self, the true self. The creation of this channel, which permits of a divine outpouring. It is as though we open a channel through the, crea through the reflective meditation, inwards, which permits a downpouring of light, a, a kind of infusion of new insight understanding. And this period of outpouring has often been called the time or the state of receptive meditation. This is why I say this is the other wing of the bird of meditation. This is really, however, a very difficult practice, for it takes us into the precincts, of course, of, of abstract meditation and represents a kind of leap from reflection to what some Buddhist schools call a state of no mindfulness, in which one has used the mind to set aside thought, and in that stilled condition, created the channel, building the bridge to the higher self, which permits an influx of light. Uh, Eckhart, in the, uh, Meister Eckhart, in the Christian tradition, illustrates this beautifully in many of his writings, this interior reception, 
which comes about at this stage. Now the problem is certain dangers are attached to this condition of meditation, for the human mind is already exposed to so many countless thought currents, impressions, impacts of various kinds, and care must be taken that a state of negativity is not entered into, that we are not talking about a state which permits free access to the mind by all these countless impressions, that this does not take over. So in one sense, our goal is right receptivity. Now this is very difficult to define, but this is where a lot of people, I think, and I've seen it, I've, I've, we get letters about it, and I've talked to people in my travels around the world, uh, mostly are here in the United States, who have jumped at once into this kind of receptive meditation without reflection. And it has turned into a negative condition in which there was no longer any control over what was being received and consequently no discrimination and everything that came through. It's like uh, rather than being able to turn on your radio to a precise band, you could turn the radio knob and all of the radio waves were present at once. Do you know what I mean? You see? Everything is present at once. Whatever stations were broadcasting, you hear them all together and you're not able to distinguish then between one and another, nor are you able to evaluate. On one there may be uh, some advertising for spaghetti, and on another there may be some beautiful Mozart, and on another there may be a lecture on, uh, on higher mathematics, and so on. And you will give all of these equal value, you see. And this is what comes to happen if receptive meditation is not the result of reflective meditation, in which the thought, thought processes are controlled, stilled, but controlled, so that you can select, as it were, and give some discrimination to what is impinging on the mind. This is where I mean, this is what I mean by our goal is right receptivity. In one sense, of course, the very recognition of the sea of impacts, is, which is all about us, uh, buffeting us, protects us, this very recognition that there is this going on. We're all the time, you right now are being buffeted by my thoughts, you see. It's hard to close me out, in a sense. You do momentarily, and maybe even more than momentarily, while you go off into your own thought realm, and then suddenly you're buffeted by some word I say, some thought I send out, and so on, you see. But we're all the time being buffeted. And in some sense, this is a protection to us, for it is helpful to realize the endless stream of impressions to which we are exposed subtly and unconsciously, as well as consciously. And knowing this, therefore, we should be on our guard against mass influences that are constantly impinging. And this is happening all the time. Just get into a, a mass of people, a crowd of people, where there's excitement, haranguing going on, and immediately you're caught up in it, aren't you? You're, you're aware of it. Walk into a group of people in a church who are praying. It's easier for you to pray, isn't it? It's much easier in that atmosphere. All of the time this is about us. The, the mass influences are constantly impinging. Well, of course, there are very subtle currents from many different sources. Psychic impressions, for example. In this state of receptivity, we may be buffeted by all kinds of psychic impressions. And this is where it is all too easy to make mistakes, not knowing if our thinking is our own or is influenced by some extraneous source not being able to distinguish whether an impression is of a truly spiritual origin or simply a psychic distortion we have picked up on the astral world, on the way inwards, as it were. Well, there are really no quick and easy answers to this situation, I'll tell you right now. 
But the solution really lies in developing our own strong center of awareness from which we can look out on the subjective as well as the objective worlds. So we have to recognize that there's a hairline division between an over-positive attitude and one that is too negative, between action and stillness, between mental creativity and a passive absorption. Again, if I can quote Sri Krishna Prem in the Yoga of the Bhagavad Gita, essentially, he says, the method consists of gaining such control over the mind processes that they can be stilled at will, thus enabling the consciousness to perceive the truth like a calm lake reflecting the eternal stars. The state, he continues, is not one of mental vacuity, as represented by some critics, and still less is it one which is produced by some occult mechanism or other. The center of consciousness withdraws its attention from the world of outer phenomena, whether of sense or of thought, passes through the central point which is itself and emerges in the spiritual world of the buddhi, intuition. Now this is the process. Very easy to write about, you see, very difficult to achieve. Paul Brunton in his work, The Wisdom of the Overself, makes very much the same point. Mere mental quiet is an excellent thing as a step on the upward way, but it is not true transcendence. The mental blank, wrote Brunton, which is so often the absorption state of ordinary yogis, is not the same as the self-understood awareness, which is the absorption state of the philosophic yogi. The diffuse, drifting negativity of the first is inferior to and different from the discriminating, intelligent alertness of the second. The one merely refrains from thinking, the other actively engages the thought-free consciousness in understanding its own nature. I've always loved that phrase, the thought-free consciousness, because this is what we're talking about, the thought-free consciousness. So the state of receptive meditation is a state of positive listening, and for this an effort of will is necessary. The very setting up of a point of silence invites a flood of sensations or impressions or images to invade our privacy. And the best technique is not to fight them, but to let them play on the periphery of consciousness, as it were, without giving them attention. The holding of this state is sometimes helped, indeed, by repeating some word or phrase, evoking some image. For example, with serenity, invoke, evoke the image of a still lake. Or repeat, repeat the phrase, be still and know that I am God. This kind of mental repetition does begin to clear the area of consciousness, as it were, from these impressions, an, uh, external impressions. An analogy here might be helpful to us. It's been used by some writers. A searchlight directed by someone on earth upon objects in the sky in reflective meditation, the searchlight is sent out horizontally, as it were, sweeping across the field of consciousness, correlating, formulating, interpreting, seeing more clearly everything in its domain. And in receptive meditation, having seen the whole field, the light is directed upwards, scanning the depths of the sky and permitting what is hidden in the very depths to be revealed. So in the opening of this channel through positive, receptive listening, what may we expect to receive? Well, I think we can say very simply, new insights which can transform our lives. Above all, it is not, we must be sure about the nature of the insight that comes to us. And so I suggest the main criterion, and I am convinced the one that is absolutely the most valid criterion in testing the source of the insight or intuition that comes to us, whatever you wish to call it, is its impersonality. This is the absolute key, it seems to me, to determining whether the source is indeed one's own immortal self. From that level of selfhood is its impersonality. 
messages that boost the personality, that flatter and hold high promise, I think are immediately suspect. Don't listen to them. Immediately suspect. Messages that are separative, divisive, personal in any way. And so to me, the one clear criterion, now there are others, of course, but the one clear one is its impersonality. Another point, of course, do not be discouraged. The searchlight may point up and it may see them that the sky is black indeed and nothing comes down, as it were. The results of meditation, of course, do not always occur, occur at once. In fact, they may not occur ever in some sense. It depends on what you're looking for when you say results of meditation. What are you looking for? The real results are not in terms of any messages from on high, intuitions, insights that flood the mind and stir the heart. The real results of meditation are the eventual transformation, the transforming possibilities of whatever happens, the transformation of the personality. And this, after all, is the goal of, of meditation, the goal of yoga, the goal of all spiritual evolution, to transform the personality. Before trying a meditation that involves reflection and receptivity, I'd like to briefly sketch what may be involved in this type of meditation as related for example, to the meditation on the nature of the self, one of the seven types that Christmas Humphreys mentions in his book on concentration and meditation. We all know or think we know something about ourselves, don't we? You think you know yourself fairly well. We perceive ourselves as both subject and object, don't we? I can talk about myself as though it were out there, but I also have, uh, we, I can observe myself and I, can also, I also am the observer that is doing the observing. But the self is really a mystery, isn't it? And so to, we are to undertake an examination of the self of which one is aware. Now one can couple this then with the meditation on passing through the bodies. And say, for example, I, that is my real I, I am not my physical body, and we look at this, we reflect on it, we analyze it. I am not my physical body. I am not my emotions. I am not my mental processes. What then am I? What is the self? And we can then open up in, in our reflection. What is the self? It is in this body. It has some relation to it. It is in everybody. It is universal, it is particular, it is all, everywhere, and so on. We can go on in this way. So trying this and coupling it, therefore, with visualization, concentration, and imagination into reflective meditation and then receptive meditation, I'd like now to try, if you will join me, in this kind of meditation on the nature of the self. So let us relax, sit easily, however you wish, comfortably. Breathe naturally. Take a deep breath and let it out so that there is a full relaxation. And the vehicles are aligned. Now imagine a closed lotus bud. It is tightly closed. Visualize it. Concentrate on it. Visualize the shape of the bud resting on its broad green leaves on the water. Picture the smooth texture of its petals, 
the closely folded form. Now visualize the bud opening slowly, revealing petal after petal as the flower opens wider. See its full beauty emerging, its golden center radiating in the sun. Now hold this picture of the open lotus with a sense of joy and admiration. Recognize the lotus as a symbol of inner growth unfoldment and expansion and reflect on the correspondence between the self and the open lotus. Let go the symbol of the lotus, the self is one, listen to the self. Now let the light of the self flow down into the mind as the sun warms the lotus. And let that light spread out flooding the whole personality, emotions, thought, body harmonized in the light. Fold the lotus into a bud 
and return to the brain consciousness. The Theosophical Society presents Joy Mills in a talk entitled Creative Meditation. Now tonight I'd like to look at quite another type of meditation, a type which, interestingly enough, I think, is at least, is becoming more and more recognized as useful and important in the world today. Uh, perhaps it is rather typical of what has come to be called and probably overcalled this Aquarian age. Everybody is talking about the forms and techniques of a new period in consciousness, a new advance in consciousness. And this type of meditation is really based on group effort and on the concept of cooperation. And so this is what we might term, what I've chosen to term and what some writers have termed, creative meditation. It might also be called meditation for service because it, it answers that question, all right, I have come within, I have reflected, I am gradually learning some of these techniques of meditation that bring about a condition in my own consciousness, which is a point of stillness, which permits uh, some illumination to come. But now what do I do with it? How can I use this? How can I work with others? And so I, ch I like to think that this particular type of meditation is a service meditation, creative meditation. Now really, all meditation is service of one kind or another. Even meditation that may seem purely personal, that is to say I am concerned with developing that kind of consciousness that permits of an atmosphere of peace, of serenity, of compassion, the building into myself of those qualities, those characteristics that seem idealistic, to which I give the term spiritual, that even that kind of meditation, which may be called purely personal, in a sense is also a meditation of service that we can't, because really we cannot change ourselves without in some measure affecting the world about us and everyone else. If I lead a certain kind of life, I determine that I will uh, lead this kind of life uh, that there will be a regular meditation, that there is a certain mode of living. I obviously cannot change myself without having some effect upon my environment, bringing about some change then in the conditions about me. And so we really cannot effect changes in ourselves without changing our environment. In fact, the only way ultimately to change our environment is to begin by changing ourselves. And I think a moment's reflection on this fact will soon make it very apparent that we cannot begin with saying, now look, what you need to do with your life is to meditate, and you'll be a nicer person, and then I'll be able to get along with you better. You know, of course, this would be much simpler if we could do this, and we could just get everyone else to doing what we think they ought to do. And you would all be much easier to live with if you would just take up the practice of meditation, you see. And meanwhile, I'll go on my merry way, uh, doing what I want to do, thinking violent thoughts and uh, sending out angry emotions and uh, um, breaking up the furniture <laughs> and so on, you see, while you sit and uh, peacefully meditate and uh, get out of my way. You, know, you see, if you would just go into your private rooms and meditate and stay out of my way, uh, the world would be a much better place to live in, wouldn't it? Obviously. Well, really, this is not so. We, we cannot work on ourselves and we cannot change ourselves without 
changing the world. And so the lifting of ourselves to a higher level of awareness, entry into a new and wider area of consciousness, is in and of itself a lifting of the whole. It does constitute a service to our fellow human beings. Each one of us in this sense, each human being, is an intermediary between the world of light and the world of darkness, between the spiritual realm of reality and material, daily, physical existence. Part of our responsibility, I am utterly convinced, part of our human responsibility, each one of us, a responsibility that, in my estimation, includes the practice of meditation, involves becoming a mediator between these two realms of our being. Meditation, in fact, I think, increases our proficiency in relaying the powers of the spiritual realm into the physical, material world. Because man, by his very nature, the human being, by his very nature, is a transformer. He's a kind of transforming station, trans, uh, if we want to put it this way. He, he's an electrical transformer. <coughs> Through us, the energies of spirit are stepped down and made useful in the world of matter. All the scriptures of the world, for example, lay stress on man's central role in the salvation of the world the lifting, the alleviation of suffering, the establishment of peace, the changing and transmuting and enlightenment of humanity. In the vast mechanism of the universe, it is very easy to feel that we don't count for very much, isn't it? When we look out and we see the complexity of the universe about us, we feel as individuals that we're probably very, very ineffectual. We really don't count for much. But I think that this is a thought that should not overtake us. It should not really be uppermost. Because what we think, what we do, what we th uh, how we feel, does have an effect upon, an influence upon, the whole world about us. It's as though throwing a stone into a quiet pool has ripples that go on and on and on. So throwing out an emotion, a thought, into the atmosphere about us has ripples the extent of which we cannot really estimate. We do not know. I may, for example, feel all jangled, disturbed, angry. I communicate this to you, to just one person. You're sitting next to me. I communicate it. You become angry, jangled, nervous, tense. You communicate it to the next one. And so it goes on and on and on. And pretty soon everyone within that sphere and even beyond is feeling something of this jangled, nervous, angry, upset condition. So if this is true, then equally if I communicate serenity, understanding, not just a facade of it, but deeply within as a channel of that kind of power in the universe, then this must communicate itself to you and to you and to you. And you become the transmitter of it and it goes on and on. You see, if we accept the premise, and this is a fundamental premise in the Theosophical philosophy, if we accept the premise that the entire universe is really a universe, one system, uni, not a multiverse, but a universe, if we really accept this premise that it is an interconnected web of consciousness, what has been called by one writer a psychic tissue in which each one of us is embedded, then I think, if we really accept this, if we really come to act upon this, then we must recognize 
that every thought, every emotion, every desire, feeling, action brings about an effect in this psychic tissue which is the universe. So I cannot any longer think independently of everything else that is going on in the universe. So every time we turn within in meditation, we are linking ourselves not only with our own interior self, but also with infinite powers, with the salvaging forces which we can channel into the thought and emotional atmosphere around us. And this becomes a very um, important reality for us, and we really experience it. Now, beyond this, however, and this still is talking of this area of individual meditation, as it were, but in which there is always this effect. It becomes creative in that sense. Beyond this, however, meditation can be undertaken as a specific form of service. So that while all meditation, as I, as I say, is creative to a certain extent, there can also be a planned creative meditation, utilizing the basics of meditation about which we've spoken so far, concentration, visualization, reflection, reception, and directed to a specific service, creative in that sense that it is directed to a specific service. It is always, of course, an impersonal objective, and we'll talk more about this in just a moment. Perhaps the two major types of service meditation, creative meditation along these lines, are, of course, meditation, group meditations for peace and group meditation for healing. These are probably the best known, and within these there are many, many kinds and techniques of meditation. Now, a fundamental principle which we must recognize as we consider this form of meditation is, of course, the power of thought. I've just been speaking about the whole thought atmosphere in which we are embedded. But beyond that, we have to recognize that thought is an actual potency. It is a power. The power of thought is a reality, is an actuality. And of course, the idea that thought is a tangible potency which creates, has influence, affects others, is a concept that's more and more acceptable in the world today, you know. Uh, for example, in recent years, there have been numerous examples and numerous demonstrations and experiments concerning the influence of thought on plants. Many of you may have read of these or seen them, uh, tried them out for yourself. The plant that is loved and the plant that is watered and given everything but is just ignored, is not loved. There have been numerous experiments uh, along this line uh, dealing with the influence of thought on plants. Now, we don't have to experiment with human beings to know what thought and love and caring can do. Uh, certainly there are evidences of this also, all too tragic evidences of the lack of this uh, in some cases. And uh, psych the psychological annals are full of case histories of children who, whose neglect has led to the fact that they are no longer really acting as human beings. Uh, but we won't go into that. But here is the influence of thought. So the idea that upon our right thinking and the creative uses to which we put thought depends both uh, what we make of ourselves and the world around us is not really such a strange idea as it might once have been. And perhaps the effects of thought, of course, are not always seen or at least uh, noticed as clearly as the effects of our more tangible feelings. If I feel um, just in a state of feeling, if I feel anger, for example, and uh, uh, you may be more aware of it than if I am sitting thinking in a meditative state on brotherhood. And you say, well, you know, 
uh, the Theosophical Society is filled with members who have been thinking brotherhood for nearly a hundred years and it hasn't come about in the world as yet, so obviously it's all a failure. Uh, you haven't been able to do very much. Um, perhaps we're looking for the wrong results. At least there is a greater awareness in the world than a hundred years ago. Whether this is due to the Theosophical Society, uh, I don't know. Uh, we, we aren't sitting around patting ourselves on the back. We're continuing to do our job of thinking and acting, we hope, and trying to realize this ideal. So we have, because it isn't quite as visible, because it's a little more difficult to see the effects of thought, we have yet to develop, I think, a complete sense of responsibility for our thinking. This is not to say, of course, that thought is not as powerful an energy as emotion, but we haven't recognized it. And we perhaps feel, well, I can get away with thinking something. You know, it's as though we can sort of cheat on life. Well, we can't cheat anywhere down the line. You see, I can say to you, oh, how lovely to see you. And all the time in my mind is going on, I wish to heaven you'd get out of my way, you're disturbing me. <laughs> you know, all the time the mind is going on, you see, and we're saying, how very nice to see you. And inside, we're seething with thoughts that would, you know, demolish you, you see, <laughs> would destroy you. And we think that this has no effect. We're cheating. This is what I call cheating life, because we can't do this. We are responsible for the thoughts that are there. And the thoughts must come. We talked about exercises in alignment early on, you remember, and examined this whole thing of this interior alignment where the mind is going off in one direction and the emotions in another and the physical actions in yet another. So it does follow that to think creatively on that which is needed in ourselves, in others, and in the world will build that ideal, that quality, and strengthen it from within. Thought, in other words, thought rightly used, can recreate both ourselves and our surroundings. I've always loved the admonition in the epistle of St. Paul, the letter of St. Paul to the Romans, and it's one we might well bear in mind. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because this is the whole key to the transformation process. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now the renewal of the mind is a creative process. The very process of renewal is a process of transformation, which is a creative process. And by that renewal, it's as though one opened the doors of the mind and let a fresh wind blow through and cleared out all the cobwebs of prejudice and desire and emotionalism and so on. And there was a fresh wind there, the wind of the spirit blowing through consciousness. And out of that renewal, a transformation takes place which enables us to transform the world. Now there's one other aspect of thinking that we must look at in this power of thought, and that is that thinking creates what have been called thought forms, which means that there can be actual coagulations of substance or matter, if you prefer to call it that, at the mental level actual coagulations of energy, which take on, therefore, a certain form. There have been books written by this, uh, on this, and there is a book, in fact, uh, in our Quest Book series. And as you know, I never lose an opportunity to mention a Quest Book, if I can help it. And the bookstore is open this evening. <laughs> uh, there is a book on thought forms, which depicts some of the forms seen by clairvoyance uh, in connection with various strong thoughts. Now, these thought forms are, as I say, co coagulations, condensations of mental matter, thought matter, which are imbued with a certain energy and even a life force. 
And where a group may be thinking together on a particular subject or may be caught up in some uh, thought pattern, a mass thought form can be created. It can become widely influential. And, as I say, clairvoyants have described such thought forms. So it may be suggested that the objective of creative meditation is to build a thought form, the thought forms in the world that are needed, that, are, that can be influential in helping other people come into an atmosphere which will induce in them that kind of thought which will be beneficial and helpful. And so it can contribute to the strength and influence of spiritual qualities in this way and can also create a channel through which those qualities can come into actualization in the world. Actually, we do not really initiate the thought forms that we work with because if we are dealing with such matters as peace, healing, enlightenment, we must know that these already exist and our meditation is aimed at strengthening and clarifying them in the mental realm, bringing them, as it were, from the archetypal realm of reality into manifestation at the mental level and spreading out so that it is as though participating as we do in this whole psychic tissue, we help to build into that tissue the realization of those qualities which exist at even subtler levels, the subtler levels of reality of the spirit. So that there they can be more influential in the lives of men and can be turned, as it were, with a greater, into a greater facility. In one sense, our meditation is creative because our work is to transform the universal pool of thought which encompasses us all and in which we are all participating. Transform it into that kind of thought atmosphere that everyone is in, as it were, that enables each one to receive his own enlightenment. Now, for creative meditation, the same initial procedure as for other forms of meditation can be used to orient and dedicate ourselves to the work at hand. Let us suppose, for example, that as a group we are going to meditate on peace, and we will uh, have a meditation at the end on this subject, but let's talk about it, uh, about it first. Initially, we focus our energies as a group, and then meditate reflectively on the quality of peace. Each individual in the group may pursue his own particular mode of thinking on this subject of peace, gathering his own understanding of peace, as it were, formulating ideas on it, building a clear picture of it, what it means, its potentialities. Then out of this there emerges a group thought form to which each one present has brought his unique contribution, colored it in some way, shaped it, in some way. The next step is to meditate receptively, to let go, to permit something else, as it were, from another source, to stop deliberate mental activity in order that, as a chalice, it opens out to receive a new understanding, a new insight, a new illumination, a new spiritual understanding from a higher or deeper level of our being. From that point, then, we move on in meditate, to meditating creatively, which means that we now direct thought once again, aided by the impressions received during the receptive period to build a deeper or a richer concept of peace. We can, for example, at this point, visualize peace changing conditions in the world. We can see it as transmuting energy. The energy that has gone into violence is now transmuted into energy that builds for peace. In this way we can, as it were, feed the thought reservoir of peace 
And from this point, we invoke peace, we open the reservoir to let it flow out over the world. Now to spell out meditation in this way may seem to make it a long, laborious process and rather dull and rather boring. But actually, once a group has the habit of this, has been perhaps meeting together for some time, and each individual in it has this habit, as it were, then each stage can be covered very, very quickly and in a relatively short period of time because there comes about a natural movement. Perhaps the leader needs to say only one word or two words for this movement to flow along in a natural way. There are two further points uh, that we should touch upon in this kind of meditation for service, the creative meditation, before we try uh, this particular meditation tonight and then open it for your discussion and questions and ideas and thoughts and so on on it. First of all, the group may be physically present and may meet together at the same time and same place over an extended period of time. There are peace groups, there are healing groups that do this, that meet together every week, for example, at the same time, in the same place, the same people, so that there comes to be a real group atmosphere and the group thought form is very easily and very quickly created. There is very little time necessary then in what may be called the preliminary stages of entering into the meditation. Or the group may be composed of individuals who link up consciously all over the world or all over a country at a certain time. Uh, or perhaps link up at, as it were, different times. In some cases there has been formed what, is, what may be considered around-the-clock healing service, where individuals uh, all around the, the world, perhaps, are linking in at particular time in their own country, and it forms a kind of continuous meditation on peace or on healing. So this is important to note, that there can be an agreement, a, a tuning in. Uh, for example, we have here at our headquarters, uh, every Thursday morning, uh, during the period of our regular staff meditation, a voluntary period when many of our staff come together for a period of quiet together for a rededication to the work uh, in which we're engaged, every Thursday morning what we call our peace meditation, a meditation for peace in the world. And we have suggested to our members in branches all over the United States that they might like to tune in at that particular time. And I know of many members around the country who do tune in at that time. And I know of individuals who have said to me, I find it easier to do it when I try to tune in at that time. This is because the creation of a thought form does make it easier to tune in again and to link up. And this is an actual fact. Uh, there are healing groups where individuals can tune in at the time of the healing group and receive either benefit or help in the creation of the channel. Now the second point I'd like to emphasize consists of a kind of warning. And I don't mean to be negative uh, by using this term warning, but it is an aspect that I think we must be extremely clear about in thinking of group meditation and this kind of service meditation, creative meditation. There may be in us, and probably there is in each one of us, a natural tendency to want to direct how the meditation is going to affect conditions in the world. You see, we may meditate on peace. Today there was a very tragic incident, as we know from the news report this evening, an extremely tragic incident in Israel. And we may feel, well, we've got to meditate for peace, and all of our meditation is on maybe the Arabs going home, as it were, you know, getting out of there. So we begin to take sides, and we think we know how the situation ought to be solved. And there's a kind of natural tendency that we want to direct how peace will come about, you see. 
and perhaps it'd be easier to have peace in the world if Russia would disappear, you see, or if China would disappear, or if, uh, you know, some of these things would just go away, uh, you know, if Nixon would resign or this or that would happen, you see. We, we meditate with a kind of preconceived idea of how things ought to work out. And in a healing service, this is one of the factors that we must be very careful about because again there may be a natural desire to see that the thought generated, the healing power generated, brings about an actual physical healing. And we feel this is the only way in which healing can take place. And that unless a person, you know, is up from his hospital bed the next day and running around, that the healing service hasn't been much use, hasn't been much good, as it were. And so there is a, a, this tendency to direct how things are going to come out, because we think we know best, as it were. A meditation to support those in positions of leadership in the country may include a kind of effort to influence their decisions, uh, to, to be sure that uh, uh, legislation is passed that we think ought to be passed, and so on. Now, we really cannot know the depth of a situation. We really cannot know the rightful issue of a particular problem. Healing, for example, may not be the restoration of the physical vehicle. It may be release from an emotional or mental condition. It may be the realization that one can live with a condition, as it were, and helping to send out that healing energy in a way that is utterly, if I can put it this way, both personal and impersonal. It's directed to an individual, but in an impersonal manner that permits what is necessary, because we do not know in what healing may consist at all. Healing may consist in release from a physical vehicle. Healing may consist in living with a physical vehicle that is not completely well, but living in a manner that is harmonious. We don't know how healing should take place. We don't know how peace should be brought about. The true solution, in other words, may be very different from what we think it should be, and events may be part of a long evolutionary pattern about which we know nothing at all. Our task then as meditators is to work with energies, not events, to invoke enlightenment and wisdom, to radiate love and understanding, to maintain calm, and above all, to have absolute confidence in the law. The law will work. And we become, we try to tune in as agents of that law in a very impersonal manner. So from this point of view, one of the greatest contributions that we can make through our meditation is just to stand steady behind the scenes, helping to keep open the channel from the inner realms of light so that light can flow out upon the world the thought atmosphere of the world become infused with light. Perhaps in times of crisis, in times of suffering and conflict, there is, of course, apt to be a great deal of emotional turbulence. And the most creative work that we can do in, medit in creative meditation, meditation for service, is to transform that turbulence into stillness, into serenity into tranquility. This may be the greatest service. This is taking into ourselves, as it were, the turbulence and sending it out in a quiet, still manner, letting it flow through, but filtering it so that it is quiet now. Well, tonight, therefore, I'd like to suggest that we together engage in a creative meditation for peace. And in order to utilize some of the techniques that we have practiced so far uh, together, visualization, um, concentration and visualization, I'd like to suggest that we go together
to the meditation room in the United Nations building in New York City. Many of you know that uh, in the UN there is a meditation room that was asked for and designed by uh, one of the former secretary generals of the UN, Doug Hammarskjöld. It's a place of quiet where delegates can go for a time of silence if they wish. The room does not have anything in it that would depict one religion or another. The only thing in it, the only object in it, is a very large block of iron, which is in the center of the room. And on this large block of iron, there is a shaft of light coming down from an unseen source above, symbolizing, I think, the light that can come to illumine the affairs of the world. And so, in this form of meditation, we can visualize this shaft of light reaching into the minds of all who work at the United Nations, all those who are there seeking to guide the destiny of nations, of peoples. So, let us take our position of quiet, relaxed, at ease, and enter the meditation room in thought, standing for a moment in its silence. Imagine the room as a central point of the councils of the world. Visualize the room with its symbolic altar in the center, the shaft of light streaming upon it from above. Reflect on the meaning of light. Picture light irradiating the minds of all those working in the General Assembly, all those who are in places of responsibility. Holding this thought, send them goodwill, asking for wisdom and compassion to illumine them in their work.
Visualize that light radiating out from the room to all countries, all peoples, all places of conflict, crisis, suffering, or need. See it resolving difficulties, removing suffering, healing, cleansing, restoring, harmonizing. May the forces of light bring illumination to mankind. May the spirit of peace be spread abroad. May the law of harmony prevail throughout the world. The Theosophical Society presents Joy Mills in a talk entitled Integral Meditation. Uh, tonight, in concluding our series, I would like to draw together, if I can, all of the varied threads of our discussions and point up the integrated nature, the wholeness of what may be called the meditative life. At the outset of this series, those who, of you who have been with us through the entire series will remember that I suggested that meditation is an inner silent path and also that it is a creative act, that it is a path that is inward and that at the same time it is a creative act. I suggested that it is the art of being, the science of the self, the positive achievement of a leap of consciousness in which all areas of consciousness are harmonized, are alert, are focused. Perhaps another way of saying it is that this leap of consciousness is answered by a corresponding shall we say, descent or illumination that seems to occur in which a spark is fanned into a flame. Well, so as a consequence of looking at this broad area of meditation, we have given attention to one aspect after another in considering the general principles. We have not attempted in this series to go into detail in each particular school of meditation or each particular technique or form of practice. Although I have tried to suggest, as you know, through the series, that these are principles that underlie all of the great schools, all of the techniques, certainly all of those schools to be found in the religious traditions, Christian meditation, the various forms of meditation in Hinduism, in Buddhism, the basis of Buddhist meditation, whether it be the school of Mahayana Buddhism, of Zen Buddhism, of Theravada Buddhism, 
whether it is in Islam, any of the great traditions, there are common principles. And so what I have tried to do in this series is to look at these common principles. The inner alignment of the vehicles of consciousness, first of all. And this cannot, I think, be stressed enough, the necessity for that kind of alignment that takes into account all of the vehicles of consciousness. And I mean by that, that does not disregard the existence of any of these vehicles, that doesn't say we must get rid of the emotional nature, as it were. After all, we can scarcely get rid of it, and nor do I think do we want to get rid of it. This does not mean that we get rid of the mind. Uh, we don't go around in a mindless state. We certainly don't want to get rid of it. We may go beyond the mind, but we do not become mindless uh, in the sense that we, we forget we have a mind and have to have others look after us uh, because the mind is absent. Uh, it means that all elements of our being are aligned, are brought into harmony, given their proper due, not overemphasized at any point, but not underemphasized. Concentration, which is a focusing of all one's vision, one's energies, to a point uh, to which one wishes to give attention. Visualization, imagination, which is the expansion from that point outwards in a manner that enables a channel to be created for the reception of a new insight, a new understanding. And then in the past two weeks, we have looked at two very broad areas of meditation, introspective, intuitive, reflective meditation, and outward-focused, what I tried to call last week service-oriented meditation, creative meditation, in which a channel is created and utilized for a purpose. And I suggested the, um, perhaps the major areas in which creative meditation has been utilized is in healing and in the uh, aspiration, the ideal of creating peace in the world. Now, in all of this, in other words, we have treated the subject of meditation as one aspect of our lives. That is, we have assumed that it is a practice in which one may engage for a certain portion of a day, let us say, a certain time each day for a certain uh, period of time, while the remainder of the day may be given over to other types of activities. Perhaps we get up in the morning, perhaps we have a certain routine where we have, after bathing, uh, dressing, uh, whatever we have, sometimes one has to have a cup of coffee first perhaps, but whatever the routine, then we have 10, 15, 30 minutes of meditation. And it's as though we can then say, well now I have accomplished that, I'll go on and do the rest of my activities today. I'll be the same usual person that I always am, getting a little bit irritated with things, uh, being very kind to, in, at other times, uh, uh, giving my attention here, there, and elsewhere, carrying on my normal uh, routine. Now, what I would like to emphasize tonight in concluding our series is that it seems to me we have to come to a point where we see our existence as a whole, as one, as a complete uh, reality in which we are engaged, that our existence, our daily lives should be all of one piece, cut out of one piece of material, not pieced together of a half hour for this and a half hour for that and an hour for that and 20 minutes for something else and, and divide it up. Uh, allocate it in that way, but that we should come to see our whole existence every single day as a totality, as all of one piece, so that meditation and action are united in an integral whole that gives meaning and significance to our existence. Uh, to put it another way, 
I would like to suggest that our daily existence is meaningful only insofar as every aspect of our being is blended together towards a purpose. Now, this is an ideal that I'm putting before us tonight, uh, putting before myself, as, uh, because I always give these talks as much to myself as to anyone else. It's a good way of reminding myself of my own ideals. So I'm talking to myself, and you're listening in, as it were, on what seems to me the ideal. And therefore, I've called this tonight integral meditation. Because it means simply that every element in our nature, every aspect of our life, can be blended harmoniously in tune with the supreme purpose of life itself. I, I'm not sure that I can make this completely clear, but it does seem to me that we can learn to participate in the total scheme and purpose of evolution only as we make conscious the totality of that purpose within ourselves. Only if we can really make the purpose of evolution conscious in ourselves do we fulfill that purpose. This is the supreme paradox, perhaps. And the way we make that purpose conscious is through a dual process, the turning within in the silent path of inner awareness, which is meditation, and the moving without, boldly without, in the path of action. And the ideal, then, is that condition where this dual process is blended into a single whole. And we both move within and move without at the same moment, as it were. That against the, that a, a, every action in which we engage takes place against a background of serene contemplation. This, of course, is in one sense the reflection of the whole creative process. So beautifully expressed in the, in the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, with one portion of myself I pervade the universe, but I remain. The eternal witness, always there, and yet active in pervading the universe. This is the great uh, duality often spoken of in Christian terminology of the, both the transcendence of God and the imminence of God. Active at every moment, and yet always against a background of transcendent reality. So I would like to suggest that the life of action is the life is a life in the world which is life in the temporal, in time. And we have to have a certain awareness of the temporal. We announced this meeting is at eight o'clock and you came at eight o'clock or thereabouts. Uh, you, you, you realized this and made the the effort that, all right, at eight o'clock I was to be at a certain place. And I can assure you I will be aware of the time and will not keep you on and on and on into the wee hours of the morning or tomorrow or, you know, just, just keep you here. We, we'd like to have you stay, but we will be aware of time. The life of contemplation, on the other hand, is a life out of the world, which is life out of time, life in the eternal. We can often realize these two aspects in turning without into the world of the temporal in which we carry on our daily existence, in which there is the historical process, as it has been called, and each one of us must participate in the historicity of the moment, as it has been said. We have our place in the historicity of existence. At the same time, the life of contemplation gives us a doorway into the non-temporal world of reality, which is the eternal. Now, the blending of these two, this is integral meditation. I suggest, you see, that there is a way of engaging in a living relationship with both the temporal and the eternal. 
a relationship, in other words, between activity and what may be called the spiritual life, the spiritual pursuit, in which these two aspects of life are seen not as separated, but as united, one with the other. Again, to quote the Bhagavad Gita, which is such a beautiful scripture, there is the statement, now you shall hear how a man may become perfect if he devotes himself to the work which is natural to him. A man will reach perfection if he does his duty as an act of worship to the Lord, who is the source of the universe, prompting all action everywhere present. So we act, but with this background, which meditation provides for us, which becomes then an action that is a worship. In the heart of the Christian tradition, there is the ideal which has been set by the great example, the Master Jesus, who it is said, by his incarnation gathered into one things earthly and heavenly. Who could act but always acted out of the consciousness that I and my Father are one. And following that particular tradition, the great mystic John Ruysbroek wrote of the individual who lives his life in these two ways, namely in work and in rest, and in each he is whole and undivided. Now this is the clue, you see. He lives his life in two ways, in work and in rest, and in each he is whole and undivided, for he is wholly in God because he rests in fruition, and he is wholly in himself because he lives in activity, and he is perpetually called and urged by God to renew both the rest and the work. A very beautiful statement. So we, in one sense, are touching upon a whole subject which we have explored in previous series here, the whole area of mysticism, because it does touch upon this area, of course. I, I think, uh, as I uh, read and so on, that no one in our time has perhaps more elegantly and beautifully expressed what has been called the co-inherence between the temporal and the eternal than Théard de Chardin who combined in himself the mystic, the priest, and the scientist, the paleontologist, who was out there in the fields, in the digs, you know, and in his very remarkable and beautiful little book, The Mass on the World, he wrote, For me, all joy, all achievement, the very purpose of my being and all my love of life all depend on this one basic vision of the union between yourself, with a capital U, this was addressed to God, and the universe. Let others, fulfilling a function more august than mine, proclaim your splendors as pure spirit. As for me, dominated as I am by a vocation which springs from the inmost fibers of my being, I have no desire no ability to proclaim anything except the innumerable prolongations of your incarnate being in the world of matter. That whatever he was doing, there was the celebration of the Mass. Uh, this whole little book, which is, I think, so remarkable, came out of his experience where he was engaged in his paleonto paleontological work in China, where he was out in, in, a, in the desert and in the, in the fields where there was no altar. And here was the uh, holy day, Sunday, and no altar, no chalice, no host, none of the paraphernalia for, for which a priest is accustomed to have in order to celebrate the Mass. And it suddenly came to him out of his contemplation and meditation in the midst of his work that he was celebrating the mass of the world. A, a beautiful book that arose out of that, combining, you see, the life of contemplation, the life of action. 
In other words, the life of meditation and the life of work or action need not be, they should not be, and ultimately they cannot be regarded as separate. And this, I think, is one of the keys. So often, you see, we, we may say, well, this is my meditation time. Don't disturb me. Don't come around. Don't let the telephone ring. Don't let the cat in now. Don't do anything because this is the meditation time. Can we really ultimately separate it? Or should we bring this, finally, out of out of long practice, yes, of course we need a time. I'm not saying we don't need a particular time. But supposing something else comes along. Can we meditate on the bus going to work, on the train? Can we meditate in the midst of some emergency that arises? So it seems to me what the ideal is, is this flowing together, this integration, and therefore only as our practice of meditation has an effect upon our lives, a real effect in terms of our actions every day, can it be said to be true meditation, transforming us in a creative way. And only as our daily activities flow naturally out of the deeper awareness of the ground of our being can they be said to be meaningful and helpful, transforming in a creative way the world about us. And so integral meditation is really integral living. Recently, in the Quest Book program, we published a book called Integral Yoga. And much of this is hinted at in this book. Uh, I have tried to introduce some other ideas that are not focused there. But in that book, Dr. Chaudhry suggests that there are five basic principles in what he has termed integral yoga or integral meditation which result in three aspects of um, right action. A simple enumeration even of these will indicate at once, I think, the underlying concept which I have been trying to express. The principles as he gives them, uh, and it seems to me they flow very much, uh, coincide with what I've been saying, are self-offering, inner exploration, self-energizing, critical evaluation, and existential experience. And I'll come back to these in a moment. Now these, all of these give rise to what we might call right action. The basic aspects of which are self-expression, self-poise, and self-donation. And I think you see it once just in giving these terms how closely they are interrelated so that one can say the life of meditation is the life of action and the life of action is the life of meditation. Self-offering, first of all. What we're talking about is the process of self-alignment. Self-offering depends upon the complete alignment of the self to be offered as a channel for meditation alignment of the elements of the self, and alignment of the whole self with cosmic reality. It is an offering, therefore, in the sense that this alignment is brought about by the recognition that there is a purpose, which is the integration of the individual with the universal creative process. And so meditation, in that sense, is an act of dedication to the cosmic purpose of existence. And as we do perform that act of dedication, it is a self-offering. But in order to perform this act, self-exploration is necessary, which includes both the observation, uh, the observation of both the self and the not-self, which calls for the techniques of concentration and imagination. One probes the depths of the immortal self. And in doing so, there is a self-energizing that is called into, into being. It reaches, it, uh, it reaches its height when the divine spark in man leaps into a flame because it is as though something, well, we always use these up and down, and it's not up and down or in or out, really, but it's as though something from above touched it and it flamed forth. And 
we say there is light, there is illumination, there is an awareness that is overpowering. But this self-energizing is called into being when there is this alignment and exploration of what is the depth of the self. For there certainly is within every individual an energy potential. In the East, of course, this has been called, as we may all know, Kundalini. This is a power within man. And in modern psychology, I think it is, I, I relate this to the libido, the psychic energy which is present within us. We have available to us, in other words, an energizing force by which there can come about a true conversion in consciousness, which is simply a turning about of consciousness, a refocusing of consciousness, an intensification of existence. And when we know how to tap this energy potential to use, utilize it constructively and creatively, then there is a new dimension in our lives in terms of what we are able to accomplish. It is really like a high voltage power, which can, of course, cause damage. And this is where, indeed, in some practices of meditation and yoga, awakening this energy potential too soon, too rapidly, without proper controls, can, as it were, be like turning on an electric switch and not having an insulated wire <laughs> there, very definitely, and damage is done. And it, therefore, it's been compared to fire, which can burn. Now, there are times when it's useful to burn up some things, but there are other times when fire needs to be under control, <coughs> and certainly in this case, needs to be under control. So. As a result, a clear sense of values must be present. And for this reason, critical evaluation has been included as an essential ingredient in meditation. Critical evaluation, which is really what we've talked about already as reflection. Reflection based on a value system. And this involves a sense of responsibility. For what purpose are we using this energizing potential within us? You see, to what end are we using this? This is the key question always. What is the purpose in our awakening, this energy potential? And so the final phase may be called existential experience, which is the creative phase developed out of a sense of values that, in other words, I, uh, if I engage in the practice of meditation, it is in order that I may, in some manner, become a better channel for service in the world. There is a purpose beyond the immediate personal self. May contribute in some meaningful manner because I believe the universe is meaningful. And this phase, then, is based on some kind of direct insight into the ultimate ground of existence. We bring the non-temporal now into the temporal. We make imminent the transcendent. There is freedom and spontaneity in action because we act in harmony with the underlying law, the universal law of life. Action, in, no, in other words, and here is where we turn now from this inward movement. Action now is no longer engaging in some humdrum task from which we hope to escape just as soon as possible in order to return to meditation, which often is the way. If we can wash the dishes twice as fast, even if we break all the cups, at least we can get back to the peace and quiet of meditation. If we can get the children off to school half an hour earlier, perhaps we'll have time for meditation, even if it means they're standing out in the cold waiting for the school bus. Uh, whatever it may be, if we can cook a quicker dinner, uh, we can get back to meditation sooner or have a longer period, and so on. Action is often seen as simply an, um, uh, as an escape, or uh, uh, we hope to escape from it in order to return to this inner condition. But in this condition, 
in this awareness of the freedom and spontaneity of action which arises naturally out of the contemplative life, it is not the imprisonment of the soul, but its creative release in daily existence. I act because I must act in the world as it is. And I act in accordance with the need at the moment. Action then does not degenerate into routine or become mechanized. It is creative and it is recreative because it flows from an inner spirit of constant awareness. It flows from an attitude of mind and heart that is always present no matter what we are doing. And so action comes to have three aspects, self-expression, self-poise, and self-donation. Self-expression means simply that each individual has his own unique center of being and becoming. In the Sanskrit, it is called svadharma, his own particular beingness, the isness of the individual. And when he has touched that center through meditation, his action outwardly is an expression of that self-being or self-becoming, and so the action becomes meaningful, joyous, free. It is the natural action that flows because he has touched his own center of the self, his own immortality. When we have touched this, this deep center, of what is the essential being, what is our own essential nature through meditation, there comes, I think, a self-poise in all our actions. A quiet confidence is born, a confidence out of which there is the courage to act in accordance with our own nature, svadharma, our own interior being. The courage to act in accordance with the deep center within. And this self-poise, I think, is so seen, it's so demonstrated, evidenced in the saints, the mystics, in the, in the really ordinary individuals who have engaged in meditation over a long period of time. One is aware of an interior poise that nothing outside seems to disturb. We are enabled to maintain an inward calm and even temper in the midst of all the changes of fortune. One acts and yet does not act. It is a kind of non-action in action because there is a core of imperturbability in all our movements. Not an easy condition, but an ideal condition. As I said earlier, I'm giving this talk to myself to remind myself that this can be present. So that an emergency arises, there is that center that is never touched by that emergency. One acts and yet does not act. And so out of this self-poise, which results from true self-expression, action is done as a self-donation, a self-giving. One gives oneself wholly where he is. I think so often of a beautiful little book that I came upon some years ago, written by a member of the Society of Friends, the Quaker movement. And the title of the book perhaps explains best what its contents were, uh, or are. <laughs> the book is still in existence. The title simply was, Being Present, where one is. Being present where one is. Now it is this kind of self-giving that arises as an action, quite naturally, out of this background of meditation. How often we are not present where we are. My physical body may be before you. I may seem to be giving you my attention but I am not present. I, my mind is going on about what I'm going to do tonight, what I'm going to do tomorrow, what I'm going to do next week, and I'm thinking, I wonder how quickly I can get away from this person. How can I escape? 
Is there some way I can end this conversation? Uh, all sorts of things are going on, and we are not present. So being present where one is, is the completion of this action in which there is a full self-giving of oneself. For in this, our ultimate loyalty is to the inward vision of truth, but our action is hallowed because it is offered without any preconditions, without any reserve, on the altar of the ultimate good of all humanity. This, of course, is the final self-giving, the action that is out of the expression of that interior vision of the immortal self, which is one in the, with the self in all, which gives that poise of confidence that enables one to act truly at the moment. And in that action, gives himself fully to whatever is the action. So this is what I suggest is the whole reason, really, for undertaking meditation at all, for even beginning the practice of meditation is for this essential purpose, that this will come about, the integral meditation that is the integrated life, in which meditation and action are mutually balanced, harmonized, and there is the complete flow. Meditation becomes such an integral part of our lives that it is no longer only a practice engaged in whenever we find it convenient or for a certain period each day, regardless of any other need, we may continue to practice it in that way, and I would hope we would. And indeed, this is necessary, because the more we practice, just as the pianist does not, the, the genius in the piano does not cease to practice his scales, he continues to practice every day. So, in the li this life, a period of time, yes, is devoted to the practice of meditation. But it comes to the point where this forms the background of our entire life. And then, therefore, well, as I've said, when an emergency arises, and we cannot meditate at our usual time, but are disturbed for some reason, the meditation still takes place, even as we act, to meet whatever the need that has arisen. And this is, as I say, what I mean by integral meditation. And if meditation uh, does not serve that purpose, I think, quite frankly, we have missed a very essential value in our lives. We've missed uh, something that is thrilling, that is joyous, that is recreative constantly, so that we are always new people, inwardly renewed. Our actions are no longer just reactions. They are truly actions flowing from that center. So, obviously, there is no one meditation that will illustrate what I've been talking about, no one meditation that will give, as it were, the, the summation of this kind of, of integral meditation. But tonight, therefore, I'd like to use for our meditation together one that I think perhaps begins to open the way to this kind of integrated and whole approach to the subject of, of the life that is complete in meditation, in action. And so if we can have a period of meditation now, as we have been having each week, and align ourselves inwardly. Take a comfortable position so that the body does not intrude itself on our attention. We feel inwardly quiet, at ease. All the usual thoughts, 
concerns, anxieties are set aside and the mind is still as a deep pool, reflective, Look for the light. The light is hidden everywhere. It is in every rock and in every stone. The light is nearer than aught else within a man's very heart. All comes forth from the light, and to the light all shall return. Look for the light. Follow the light. The sun's rays shine on all alike. He who would feel their warmth upon his skin must leave his shut-in cave and seek the open air. He who would experience the divine compassion in his soul must leave the cave of self and seek the wider being. Follow the light. I am the light. In the midst of our being stands the Lord of past and future. The inner self is always seated in the heart of man. Let a man draw that self forth from his body with steadiness. Let him know that self as the bright, as the immortal, yea, as the bright, as the immortal. I am the light. Let the light shine. Ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. Arise, shine, for thy light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. The splendor of the whole world will be thine and all darkness shall flee from thee. Let the light shine.
Thank you very much.